I would love it if a man would come round to, to my flat to do such things, have got so much that needs to be done. There you are. If that's not, if that's not an invitation for you, Mark Saggers, I don't know what is. Uh, thank you to my team, Isla Nones, Carla Batiste, Finley Knowles, Munti Gal, Jack uh, Thurbron, and Porrick Birmingham. And thank you for being part of the show. I will see you next Saturday and next Sunday. In the meantime, have a lovely week lovely 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 valentine's day uh as well um in the meantime i'll leave you to the wonderful mark saggers full of love for him uh back next week this is talk tv My friends, it's Talk Today with me, Jeremy Kyle. And me, Nicola Thorpe. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. What a happy start to Monday. <laughs> An Arctic blast, the royal family are up in arms, more problems with migration. Welcome to Monday. Good morning, Rosie. Good morning, Nick. We're here in Tamworth for you to find out exactly why some people are travelling halfway around the world and queuing for hours for one of these, the humble British potato. A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. It's not in Labour's DNA to get tough on immigration. They don't feel it, they don't sense it. No officer with your level of training wakes up in the morning and says, what a great day to go and shoot somebody. This is done really as a last resort. It's done in a response, emergency response. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. She was basically saying that if I don't leave, mm. then she's going to seize my equipment. And everyone around was just outraged. There's a way to deal with knife crime, right? And I, I mean, OK, it doesn't deal with the underlying problems in society and all the rest of it, but it actually stops people getting killed. A crossbow, a hatchet? Multiple of... crossbows. Multiple crossbows? Yeah, crossbows is what it says on the press. Crossbows and a hat. Carry on, a crossbow is like a hatchet and what? A sword a and sword. a knife. How is that even technically possible? Sorry, yeah, I've Did got you... a microchip in my left hand. Let's see. Um, can we? Can you hold it to the camera so we can see? Uh, Where is it? I can't yeah, see. Yeah, you it. can't see it because it's actually inside the web of my hand here. There <laughs> <laughs> we go. Hey. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's carry on. What just happened? <laughs> Whoa! This like brought to you by Sadiq Khan, the Mayor of London. Very rarely meet anybody that says, you know, the thing about London is it's got a great mayor, Sadiq <laughs> Khan, brilliant guy. Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? Absolutely right. If I want to have a Hubba Bubba, Chocky Wocky, Bazooka <laughs> Joe flavoured vape, I can have one. But not according to Rishi Sunak, because he said, no, we can't trust you with that. If I turned up to this show having drunk mm. this vodka, uh, and was incoherent and useless, I would never be invited back on this show again. So there is a... Uh, JJ gets invited back in every time. Donald Trump didn't just win, he obliterated. This is a guy facing nearly 100 criminal charges, and yet all that's done is actually make him more popular. Trump is canny enough to know that all publicity is good publicity. I don't want a president who's been impeached. If he's able to bamboozle you, or that's the way it goes. I did my six months, I came back, nobody would touch me. I put my head down, I persisted, I carried on. Mm. Failures were amazing. Thankfully, they're illegal and you can't find them anywhere. But if you have one, you know, we can go after it. Just for the record, I do not have any grelly. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. Very good evening to you. We're going to start with Premier League. Two vital games this afternoon. One of them going the way of Manchester United. It's a fourth win for them on the bounce in all competitions. And that's for the first time this season. They were just too good at Villa. Even though Villa Park thought they were well back into it. But McTominay off the bench once more. With a strike just four minutes from the end of normal time. Earlier on in the day, West Ham United fans, a lot of them only watched 45 minutes against Arsenal. Uh, Arsenal came unstuck at West Ham last season. They didn't today. They put six past them. A real blitz towards the end of the first half finished West Ham United off. And that had them marching through the shopping centre and down to Stratford and out of the ground. We'll talk about both of those games first up. And of course, this week, news and uh, there's a lot of sniffy people within football about the possibility of having blue cards for sin bins. It's nothing we want in the Premier League or elsewhere. Stop the cheating then, if you don't want that sort of thing. Keith Hackett, Mark Halsey, Matt and plenty more to talk to them about in the first hour as well. We've then got a very important hour. It's something that we've led the way with and will continue to do so. Looking at some of our clubs once more, still with financial uh, fair play and more rules broken, possibly hanging over them. We'll revisit Forest, who've got to wait a little bit longer till April to find out their fate in the Premier League. Will it be a point deduction? A little earlier, of course, for Everton as well. Another few points could be going for them. Sheffield Wednesday, who had a big protest earlier this weekend as well in their game. Those three sides, but we will talk not just with the teams. Kieran Maguire, one of the experts, the prof who knows all about football and the pennies. And he's with us, as is Andrew Mills. Don't forget, of course, the Six Nations. Somehow, somehow, England are top of the Six Nations after the second round of matches. My word, they left it all so late. But we've got Nick Easter, we've got George Shooter to talk us about all of that. And the third test of what is already turning into a magnificent series in India is... Uh, underway on Thursday and Neil Burns and Angus Fraser will mark our cards with all of that. Always like to hear from you. Uh, if you could, you can uh, text us 87222 talk and then your message at Talk TV at Mark Saggers. Love to hear from you on the show tonight with your thoughts as always. So it's been a weekend where it was obviously going to be catch-up for the likes of Arsenal and Manchester United. Manchester United's catch-up, very different to Arsenal's, of course. And uh, we will be coming uh, back to talk in detail about Arsenal. But let's start tonight with the latest game. Uh, finished, what, 45 minutes or so ago. And it was, uh, in the end, Manchester United, who got the better of Aston Villa at Villa Park by two goals to one. They took the lead. Uh, in that game, Hoyland uh, with uh, what was uh, an easy tap-in in the end for the first goal. Uh, an equaliser from Luis, but it was McTominay off the bench, as I've mentioned once more. Really beginning to show uh, the real player that I know has been in there for some time. And I think the one thing, obviously, that the manager has managed to do is calm him down a little bit. He's like a thoroughbred racehorse that always just wanted to chew on the bit and wear himself out before he'd really done anything. Not anymore, and he's really showing uh, how good and potent he can be as a powerful goal scorer uh, inside the box of the opposition. Howard Hodgson is the former director of uh, Aston Villa Football Club Supporters Trust, is with us. Hi, Howard. Good evening, Mark. And Jay Motti, Stretford Paddock YouTube, is with us as well. Hi, Jay. I'm going to give you the floor to start with here. Because these are the sort of games that Manchester United have been failing to pick up all three points when they've let the opposition back into it. Yeah, I mean, like you say, we've we've struggled with that all season. And if you look at sort of going back to last season under Eric Sanhaga and this season as well, we've struggled away from home against the top sides. I think there's that that uh, statistic that we've not won against the team that's been in the top eight away from home for about eighteen months, which is just uh, sort of 
the mind boggles when you think of that, considering we finished third last season as well, that that's, that is still going on. So it feels like it was a bit of a moment just to get that one put to bed. And like you say, because we've been in this position before where we've scored, we've let teams back in, and then we failed to to get a winner or we've even gone on to lose the game. I did fear the worst when Villa got their equaliser, especially with the way they were sort of targeting Victor Lindelof. Leon Bailey in particular was getting on the ball and was causing him a bit of a torrid time. And to be fair, Victor Lindelof, he'd come in for Luke Shaw, who'd gone off at half time. He's not a left back Lindelof. I think he was struggling, but it's great to see United rallying around. Scott McTominay, as you mentioned earlier, he does keep coming up with these with these winners, these goals. He's be- I think he's probably best used off the bench and as, a, as an attacking option. And he's shown that time and again this season. We saw it early on, obviously, against Brentford, where we got two in, I think, was it two minutes? Yeah. And we've seen it throughout other games as well. So, yeah, a big win for Manchester United. A little bit of momentum going now. I know we've, we've had that before under Hits and Ags, especially this season. But it felt like one of those games we had to win today to stay in that top four race. We know Villa are above us. We know, obviously, Spurs are quite a few points ahead of us as well. If we lost today... I don't see a way for us getting into that top four. It's still going to be difficult. We're still playing catch-up, but I think today gave us a fighting chance. Yeah, some uh, great points you've made there. We'll, we'll come back and talk more of them in a while. How, the, these are the games that um, Unai Emery knows are ones that got away, particularly when you dragged yourself back into that game today. Yeah, it's true, Mark. Um, I thought, actually, when we got to 1-1, as Jace alluded to, I was hope, quite hopeful we'd go on and win the game. Um Although it is Man United and Villa's record against Man United is hideous, <laughs> has been for like about 30 years. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, it was, I feared the worst when they got the early goal because mm-hmm. things have started to unravel a little bit recently. Um, you know, having gone a long time unbeaten at home, nearly a calendar year, um, we've lost now our last three home games, um, albeit against good teams, Newcastle, um, Chelsea and United today. Um, but yeah, it's a bit of a signal for Villa to let in that late winner. I would have been very happy with a draw yeah, um, because yeah, it, would have kept, it would have kept them eight points behind us. Now it's five. Mm-hmm. And yeah, they, you know, they've got some momentum and we're going through a bad spell. I mean, everybody, but, has, you know, everybody fake... has a bad spell at some yes, stage in the cool. season. It, what, what, has got to happen now is that um, uh, Unai's uh, got to get the belief back in the side here again. You've had your injuries, I know that, but everybody has those as well. It's you, you, you still had your chances in this game later on, you know. We did, we did. I thought we actually played quite well today. Honestly, there's not a lot to complain about the performance. Jay mentioned about the Lindelof Bailey duo. I was quite surprised when Bailey was taken off um, because he was he was having a lot of joy. Um, against Lindelof but at the end of the day um, I've got nothing to complain about I've said this to you before when I've been on uh, you know Emery's doing a remarkable job we're well ahead of schedule mm. you know when you think we were 18th in the Premier League only 16 months ago to be in this top four fight is remarkable um, and yes we are we, we are we do have a lot of injuries at the back it's hurting us a little bit um, especially with the way we play with the high line etc so but yes, exactly as you say, Mark. Mm-hmm. We've got to bounce back. We've got to, you know, we've got to find a way again of, uh, of of remembering just how good we've been for the vast majority of his reign. And I'm sure, I'm sure he will turn it around. It'll be fine. Jay, just tell us the sense of Manchester United's fans where they are now. Ineos have obviously come in. They've begun to show what they would quite like to do as part of uh, their part share in the club now there's uh, obviously the big headlines have been made about this and that and they've got to make it the stadium of uh, uh, the north again and all all of this matter nothing matters unless you actually get it right in on a consistent basis on the pitch and secondly it's got to just be more isn't it than um, finishing sixth seventh eighth for manchester united this now has got to be uh, the very least europe as well as winning trophies again. And until that comes, uh, there won't be that complete feeling that the club itself is is beginning to loosen the reins with the Glazers, if I could put it that way. 
Yeah, I mean, I think when you look at what Ineos is saying, the sort of statements we're hearing from Sir Jim Ratcliffe and Ineos, a lot of people who are looking outside, outside Manchester United, might think, well, that's an obvious one. Football has to come first. We want to win trophies. We want to be challenging at the top. Well, that's not what's been happening under the Glazers. We haven't had that. We've had commercial aspects that seem to take a priority and just trying to qualify for the Champions League has been enough. Now, Ineos are saying the right things, and I'm cautiously optimistic. A lot of United fans I've spoken to, they're cautiously optimistic as well. But we have to wait and see. I mean, we're still in the early stages of it. They've not. I think it's only just about being ratified now. I don't think it's a fully official. No. So we've still got to wait and see what happens. But they're certainly making the right noises. In terms of this season as well, the big question is, is Eric Senha going to keep his job? Is he the man that Ineos think can take the club forward? And I think, like you've mentioned there, a lot may depend on what happens in terms of do we get European football, do we get Champions League football, to be honest with you. I don't think the Europa Conference will be deemed a success, but I think if we got Champions League football, then you can build on that and you can look at Eric Senag's record in its entirety at United and go, OK, top three finish and a trophy, and then European football or Champions League football the next season, something to build on. Uh especially if we can get an FA Cup win. I know it's a big if, but if he was to win that trophy as well, I think he'd give himself a fine chance. So there's a little bit of positivity. I think there's a sort of cautious optimism with a lot of United fans I speak to, especially when you look at the right, making the right noises. We've got some good young players. You mentioned Hoyland, obviously, is amongst the goals. Yeah. Um, Kobe Mainu coming through has been a massive breath of fresh air, and Ganacho as well. So there's some little green shoots there. You can go, OK, it looks like the club are moving forward, but... We've had 18 years of the Glazers. We've had 10 years since we last, sorry, 11 years since we last won a title. So a lot of United fans like myself were, were a bit cynical when we hear this is going to be the sort of dawn of a new era or things are going to change. We want to see it before we start getting carried away. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the, the thing for me here as well. And I've, you know, covered for a living Manchester United from, oof, uh, in the uh, late 80s, really, uh, on a regular basis. And these things do go in cycles, but here now, Manchester United still have much more to do for me because it's not a club anymore that if it put itself together and the, the revenue that it has always generated, that was known so much more around the world than a lot of other clubs because of uh, sad as well as fantastic stories and uh, performances and, and what have you. But now there are other the other clubs that, that nearly your generation has grown up with that ha have their own followers around the world. And what is going to kick in next, of course, is going to be even more of the financial side of things to buy better players, to do this, to do that, is only going to come if you can get the next generation to understand that Manchester United are still just not has-beens. Yeah, I mean, it is difficult. Like you say, there's... there's... <laughs> There's other clubs, there's other teams that are successful. There's, you know, there's the usual suspects, yeah. if you will. We've always had, I grew up, I'm old enough like yourself, to sort of remember the, the beginning of Sir Alex Ferguson's reign when it was Liverpool were the team to beat. And then we became the team to beat and we saw off challenges from Arsenal and Chelsea and Blackburn and Newcastle. And now it feels like you've got Manchester City, of course, you've got Liverpool, Arsenal have got their act together. So it's not going to be easy, especially as you mentioned there, the, the sort of the new financial fair play rules or the fact that that's getting enforced in the way it is. But United are still, for me, the biggest club in England. They're still one of the biggest clubs in the world. You look at the size of the club, the fan base we've got, the academy we've got. There's lots of reasons to believe that if United did get our act together, did get it right, and if Ineos do, do the things they promised to do, there's every reason to believe that the, the younger generation, my kids, that generation, can see Manchester United challenging for the top honours, which is where I think United should be. You've, you've nailed it. We shouldn't be just settling for top six, top fifth, or Champions League. We should be challenging for the, the Premier League and the Champions League. That's what United have always been about when I was growing up, and hopefully we can get back there again. Uh, Villa Park is always a great stadium. The whole end in full voice is something special. Always has been, uh, hasn't it, Howard? Uh, you're, you're, you're sort of within touching distance in a way, and even if it's not going to happen this season, what you've got to do now is finish this season in well, because it's still about getting one or two of those extra players into the club that perhaps Emery needs and knows what he wants to do again going forward next season and continuing to build. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I just listened to Jay there, and he didn't mention us, did he? He didn't mention us as a contender. <laughs> So that's you know. Sorry, that's apologies. I wasn't. I wasn't dismissing no, no, it. It's all right. Better season I mean, than we are. No, it's the way it you? is. Why would you? We haven't been a contender for a long time. So you're just not used to Villa being up there. It's quite. It's fine. It's 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 not a problem. I'm not having a go at you at all. Um, 
it's it but villa is a traditionally big football club you know it has a fantastic support as you say it's got a fantastic stadium historic football club but it needs to have some uh, you know a, a, a future and a present that that challenges ongoing not just flirts with it for a season or two and then drifts away mm. again mm. it has to stay in the top echelons of the Premier League going forward. So you're quite right, Mark. We've got a fantastic foundation. We've got great owners. Mm. We've got a great manager. And they've just got to keep believing and keep building. And, yeah, I mean, if we can finish in the top four or five this season, fantastic. If we finish six, it won't be the end of the world. But we must, again, go again next season and keep going. Can I ask you both just one final question? We're doing uh, financial fair play and other things in the middle hour here. Uh, Neither of your clubs are involved in the current dispute, but just as real fans, as if i standing next to you on a terrace or something like that, it'd be a seat, obviously, we'd be standing on in the Premier League. But if I just turn, turn to you, Howard, first of all, and said, do you think that it's really uh, right? The only way forward with this is if when everybody knows that there has been a problem with financial uh, fair play, that every club has, let's say, a month to deal with it and then it's dealt with rather than richer clubs being able to push it down the line with a coach full of uh, lawyers. Yeah, I agree with you that 100%. I can't stand the way it's kicked down, you know, I hate to say, but we all know who we're talking about here. Yeah. Um, Manchester City and Chelsea, I mean, in particular Manchester City. I mean, I, I would like it to be a fair le level playing field for sure. I, I don't particularly agree with financial fair play i don't think it particularly works no. um you know it, it perhaps it protects perhaps it is encouraging a uh, more sensible business practice when we look at the january window that's just passed um because people are realizing that you know there are real teeth to it um but then again you look at what's going on at city and the clear you know 115 breaches apparently but mm. you know we hear nothing and yet we've got everton and forest suffering so yes yeah. mark i think that would be fantastic if and you jay, had a month yeah. sorted out and jay what, what about for you as well because i think all clubs um we know what it's about until we get back to a stage where everybody either can do what they want because that's the way of the world in uh, um, a democracy and whatever but within football for keeping people to account i think it has to all happen at the same time if you've got charges to answer I think this goes back to that old argument about consistency, whether it's VAR, whether it's refereeing, whether it's FFP. You just want to see some consistency. I mean, Everton getting dealt with straight away and getting a 10 point deduction and Manchester City having to wait two or three years or whatever, or the, the world of football having to wait to see yeah. what happens to Manchester City's 115 charges doesn't feel consistent to me. It feels a little bit skewed. So I think if there's a consistent process there where you know what's happening, you know how long it's going to take to deal with. And also, like you say, you can get it dealt with quickly then we can get back to that thing of, you know, actually watching 22 players run around a square bit of, or a rectangle bit of grass yeah. rather than having to worry about lawyers and charges and who's got the best lawyers and how long this is going to take. Because call me old fashioned, I just prefer watching football than worrying about what's going on in the courts. Yeah, and so say all of us, I think. Jay and Howard, thank you very much indeed. Great start to the show as always. Sean Whetstone uh, is going to have plenty to say about West Ham United and Richard Butler, where Arsenal... Uh, didn't just have to believe today, they put to bed the problems that they had last season. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well. Would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said though about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> 
King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, listen. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the, Plank of the Week, Mike Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister exactly. that we've ever yeah. had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. Well, just uh, a couple of things to tell you about uh, on our podcast, which we started last weekend, The Back of the Stand. Uh, we do two a week uh, on all of the podcast uh, platforms. And uh, uh, what we're going to be doing, of course, is uh, taking a particular subject during the middle hour, and we're going to add to that for the podcast as well on the Wednesday each week. And on uh, the Monday, to a real catch-up for you uh, on what we've been doing. Of course, we want you to keep... Uh, telling us exactly how you feel, what you want to do, what you don't want to do and everything. And um, yeah, so a few of you are having a little bit of a go tonight and I quite understand it. Jim here says, uh, I was going to ask why I haven't bothered reaching out to the group who actually organised the protests. I think we're talking Sheffield Wednesday here, um, uh, uh, I'm presuming. And uh, he says, I know that we've uh, you've asked us on before and we couldn't make it, but it would have been nice to have us asked again. Uh, I'm sure one of us could have spared the time. Uh, Jim, uh, apologise for that. Um, we would love to have you on another time. We'll keep that in mind. The boys uh, behind the glass will get that uh, sorted for you as well. There is always another occasion. That's the whole point of why we want to follow clubs all the way through. We don't want to just dip in like some of the other networks do and come out when it just they haven't got anything else that they particularly want to do. We put the fans of the debates first, last and foremost. And uh, so uh, I like those sort of... Uh, uh, X's or tweets on X's, uh, whatever we say these days. So, uh, Jim, um, the boys will be in touch with you. Uh, Hawaiian Hammer is amongst many that are not happy with what happened today. And, um, well, Sean Whetstone, of course, with uh, more than just a podcast, uh, joins us now. And Richard Butler over an Arsenal podcast. Sean and Richard, good evening to you, gentlemen. Um, actually, I'm going to come to you, Sean, first of all. There's, What's good uh, about it, Sagas? No, no, well, no, no, no. There's nothing. <laughs> well, I tell you what is good about it. The thing is good about it is that you know you've come on, and I know what's going to be even better for the the West Ham fans. They want to know. I mean, some of them have said to me all sorts of different things, like uh, uh, Roy is one. You know, uh, Moyes Moyes bought. He's been a busted for, um, flush for around 18 months. Well, he he did win a European tournament last season and. <laughs> You've got all of that still going on. Um, frustration completely today, though, for West Ham United's fans. And I, I understand why. Sean. Um, hmm. Would you believe me we were unlucky and we deserve something from the game? Um, 
Uh, I haven't no, seen the game. No, of course not. Of course, course not. not. Look, I, I thought for the first, first 30 minutes, we did turn up. We were holding yeah. Arsenal. Arsenal didn't look anything special for the first 30 minutes. We're holding it. We weren't taking any chances. And I thought like, we got to the half an hour mark and I thought, oh, actually, this might not be as bad as as a first fall. Mm-hmm. You know, I was dreading it. Mm-hmm. Um, after beating Arsenal twice already and looking for the treble, of course, I have to mention that we beat them at the Emirates and in the mm-hmm. Cup. So we were looking for our treble. And we fell apart, you know, on 32 minutes, the first goal went in. And I'll be honest, the players' heads went down after that first goal. And if they didn't, they went down after the second goal and the third goal. And within 12 minutes, we were 3-0 down, um, you know, 4-0 before half time. Mm. Yeah, a lot of people left. I stayed. Um, you know, I'm not criticising anyone who left. You pay your money. You pay for your tickets, up to you whether you want to leave or not. I, I don't think it affects professional football players if they say that it does. I don't believe you. You know, it's your ticket. You can walk out if you want. Yeah. No, look, I understand and all look, of that. second half, you don't come back from 4-0. Um, and, you know, I, look, I know the manager said, I take personal responsibility. I know, I know there are people who don't like the manager and have called for Moyes ball, but players need to be... Sta- counted stand up and be counted that was just as much as a player collapse Mm. with their heads going down as it was a management the manager played the strongest team just one thing though and and sure uh richard i'll be coming to you in in just a moment as well to talk about the other side of this so uh the zonal marking that uh, you have always had at west ham uh is is found out when you have uh, a manager and a, a set play team who've scored more goals from set pieces than anybody else this season have a little different one for you, a new one for you on the edge of the six yard box there outside it. But with this opportunity, with the way five or six times they have the men to deliver, ironically, Declan Rice amongst uh, yeah. others. And, and there was, it was, you know, you're just not going to be able to defend against that. The keeper couldn't well, get anywhere close to it. You know, there was, but there didn't yeah. seem to be a way you could change well, any of that. I think Moyes said himself, Arsenal stepped up a gear. You know, fair play to Arsenal. This is the same Moyes, right, who played Arsenal mm. a month ago and won 2 0, right? Mm-hmm. Same tactics, same players. This is a Moyes who also played them and can't beat them, right? Yeah. So something didn't happen today. And fair play to Arsenal. They stood up. Declan Rice, I've got no problem with him, right? No. He didn't sit right in front of me. What a great goal. Didn't celebrate. Actually said sorry, mouth sorry to us in, in the West Lower. We had Pakatar just above us, and, and Pakatar was watching just above us in, in the boxes. And afterwards, you may or not have seen this, Mark, but um, Declan Rice came round and actually did a lap and apologised mm. and, you know, was applauded by all the fans. As did, De- you know, um, David Moyes came out at the end for the people who stayed. Yeah. And Suchek and Sufal came as well. Look, it was a bad day at the office. Yes. I don't know what else we can say. No, we dust thought... ourselves off. We go, it's our fifth worst defeat ever in the history. Our last defeat, actually, I was just looking it up, 7-1 loss to Blackburn in October the 14th, 2001. So 23 years but we just have to write it off and go, you know, yeah. well, well done, Declan Rice. I, I well think, done, Arsenal. Yeah, well, well said. And that's, uh, 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 thank you for saying that, Sean, as well. And of course, you know, you've got to see what happens next, see what you can, where you can go. As far as um, Richard, Arsenal are concerned, that's their best ever Premier League away performance when it comes to number of goals. It was, yeah, and, and a little bit surprising, maybe. I certainly wasn't expecting a, a result like that. I mean, I do think maybe the two defeats earlier in the season to West Ham played a part today because Arsenal looked hungry for revenge, you know. I think the, the game at the Emirates in particular where, we you know, we dominated that game, had 25 shots or whatever it was and, and lost 2-0, and I think that was still on our minds. You could see that, yes, we was a bit slow getting going today, and once that first goal went in, you could see the whole weight was lifted from us. Yes, West Ham did seem to fall apart before half-time. There's no doubt about that. But I just thought that we looked so focused. I, I haven't seen this Arsenal team look that sort of, um, I don't know, that ruthless as what they did today. And I do think that was part of that, those last two defeats, particularly the one at the Emirates over Christmas, where we were so 
a sort of certain we should have won that game with the way that we played. And today it was like, we're putting that right today. That almost must have been Mikel's um, team talk, I think, before the game, you know. We should have won last time. We're going to win this one. And you could see that once we got ourselves in front, that was in, that was an impressive performance from Arsenal. And mm. last season, it was the games against Liverpool and West Ham where we'd gone 2-0 up in both those games, didn't win. And that kind of sent us on the way to blowing the title. Whereas this year now, we've just beaten Liverpool at home. We've then followed up with a win away at West Ham 6-0. And are those the lessons from last year? Have they been learnt? And are we now showing that this is going to be a different Arsenal this season? We were slow starting this season. Our performances wasn't great the first half of the season, really. But since the yeah. break, we've come back. And, you know, you mentioned the set pieces. And Declan Rice has only just really started taking corners and free kicks. Mm -hmm. He was in the box for most of them in the first half of the season. They went away to Dubai, worked on the set pieces a little bit more. Declan's been taking them, and he's set up three or four goals from set pieces since um, since yeah. we got back and, in. So uh, it's mean, working, isn't it? I mean, he was brilliant today, wasn't he, Declan? And what a great gesture! If he if he did say sorry to the West Ham fans after scoring, I mean, it's a little bit strange. He's just scored a great goal for Arsenal, yeah. um, and he apologises to West Ham. That just shows what a what a guy he is, doesn't it? That shows yeah. his personality, and, and that's great, isn't it? You know, and he, he played really well again today. So fantastic. Yeah, yeah. I've always found the sort of apologising for who you play for. Um, even when you've played against them. I, I understand that some fans like all that sort of stuff and everything. Um, it, for me, I think, you know, it, you've just got to be happy for when you've had Declan and, and he's moved on and doing what he's doing now at Arsenal. And, uh, yeah, good on the on, on the uh, young man. But um, I don't think we need to worry um, too much sleep. I hate it when people don't... Uh, uh, actually enjoy scoring a goal, whoever they play for, because they play for somebody else. But uh, that's only a personal opinion. One thing I would like to say, though, uh, to you, Richard, is that there are, there's no doubt, as far as I'm concerned here, that they've managed, obviously, uh, Mikel Arteta, we know the attention to detail, but they've obviously been doing an awful lot of hard work on the training ground. You know, they, as a, as a group, they, they now look so much more comfortable than they have done. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, it's been difficult in a way because Mikel's very fixed on the, the the style of football he wants to play, and when it works, it's fantastic. As we've seen today, we've seen on many other occasions, and it's those times when it doesn't work that's when we've needed to. Uh, that's what we've needed to work on. But obviously, since we've come back from Dubai, yeah, you're right. I think in Dubai they spent a lot of time working on a lot of different things. Set pieces was one. Just think the, the general kind of relationships in the team mm. as well and, and the way that we, we're building our play up now it seems to be a little bit more direct at times maybe a little bit more direct than it was before you know we're getting i mean the, the goal that when when saka got the penalty for that second goal mm. today you know a, a, a ball through the middle yeah west ham didn't sit deep they gave us space and when you give arsenal space we're going to punish teams and that's why most teams sit back and don't play against us and west ham was a bit open but we just show we've got different ways to score goals as well now. You know, yes, we've got the set pieces, but we can also play some good football. And actually, today what I liked was that we were so direct through the centre as well, rather mm. than always going down the sides and pulling it back. We actually went through the middle quite a lot today, yeah. and I like that. And it and it worked because we got a, a few goals that way. Yeah. And, you know, and shooting from distance. You know, we need to do that more. Declan again today, brilliant. So yeah. yeah, today was and last week as well. We're building now something, and hopefully we're right back in there, aren't we? We looked out of it a few weeks ago, but Christmas when we were losing games, but now. We're back in it. Man City are going to be tough, of course. Look at the run they're on. But we can just keep plugging away, keep yep. playing like we did today, last week. And who knows and, where we, we could end up. And um, uh, one other thing for you, Sean, on that front, of course, um, West Ham United have always had fans who uh, their passion is so well known. And it's not always a great passion. It's also moments like this where they they feel so annoyed about the club and where the club is going. This is a, a, a quite a vital time, isn't it, for David Moyes and the players now to show that they really are all as one because there's going to be, it might only be a minority, but there will be distractions now from negativity from some fans at West Ham. Yeah, that, that's nothing new, Sagas. No, I know that, know. but I think it's, you know... After we, a result like that, you know, I we are. You're right. There'll the, be more. You know, we are. You know, we're a fan base that's often divided. You know, whether mm. it's Sam Allardyce or, you know, and and now David Moyes. There's a, lots of people that call it Moyes ball and don't like it. You know, whichever way you look at it, he is our most successful manager in the league. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, he's won us a European title. We've got into Europe three times. No other manager has done that. And if you look at the statistics, the goals per, you know, people talk about entertainment, the goals per game, points per game, the total wins. He he ticks all the boxes, right? Yeah. 
But, and here's the big but, people don't like the style of football we play. They call it Moyes ball. And yeah. some people, and I'm not one of them, will say, well, I'd rather play well and lose or not score the goals <laughs> than watch this dross. And, and those people can be very, very noisy. And the ball do listen. Uh, and, and it's difficult because yeah, you have to be in one camp or the other, Moyes in or Moyes out. And I think, you know, this is a critical time. My understanding is the board like Moyes and what he's done. Yeah. They respect him. Moyes likes the board. I hope neither will be swayed by the fans, but there is a chance of that. It's down to the board at the end of the day if they want to change the manager. He's out of contract in the summer and the talks are ongoing at the moment. And, and we shall see which way that goes. You know, does it... Do they listen to the noisy people who, who say Moyes out, Moyes ball, dinosaur, all these things, or, or the, the people who would say he's their most successful manager in the league ever? Yeah. Well, uh, one question to both of you. I've said I'm talking to all in the second hour. We're looking at financial fair play. Sean, uh, do you feel, as a fan now, nothing more, that whichever clubs have questions to answer about financial fair play, they should all be sorted as quickly as possible uh, and it should all be based on not how many lawyers you've got to defend yourself it not, and not based on how many charges there are and complicated things. You have to get it done swiftly. Yeah, I mean, the, look, the it's slightly different cases. We've spoken about this before where you go over and you've, you're banged to rights like Everton and uh, Nottingham Forest, or it's slightly more difficult to prove one way or the other with, with Man City. However, it shouldn't drag on. It should be done. And I think the Premier League have got an opportunity to say, let's get it done before an independent regulator comes in or it will be out of their hands. So, yeah. Good they've point. Got a, got Good. A point. They've, they've got a chance to do it or it will be taken out of their hands. Uh, Richard, what's your, what's your take? Well, obviously, Man City should be deducted 500 points, relegated four divisions, and that's obviously the only fair, the only fair solution, isn't it? But, but no, I mean, it, the, the rules seem to be a little bit um, unclear, don't they? You know, mm. no one's really sure exactly what Manchester City have done, what Everton have done, what Forest, all these other teams, and I don't know. Whatever the situation is, the the, the, the charges against Manchester City, where obviously they're only charges; they've not been proven as yet, but. You can't have that sitting over a club for one season, two seasons, whatever long it's been going on for now. It needs to be resolved, and they need to resolve it quickly. And what I mean, I don't really what whatever the punishment is, the punishment is. It's not you know I don't want Arsenal to win the league because Man City have been deducting points necessarily. I want to win it because we're the better team and we deserve to win it. But if that happens, that happens. But they need to get it sorted out because it's ridiculous that you know you've got Arsenal. Uh, you know we didn't spend any money in January. We, we're respecting the rules, the financial fair play. Mm. You know the other clubs, Newcastle, are trying to respect the financial fair play. Manchester City don't seem to care because they know that in they've been doing this. What they, these charges go back four five, six years. Yeah. You know what I mean? And that's, that still haven't been, it still hasn't been resolved. And it's it's mad that Everton are suffering, not in a forest are going to suffer now. And Man City broke the rules six, seven years ago and they still haven't been punished. And it's still going on and they may never be punished just because they've got more money. It yeah. seems unfair. And I think there needs to be one rule across for everybody. If you break this rule, that rule, you, you, you get deducted 10 points. That's it. So it's like a yellow card, isn't it? You get a yellow card, you get a second yellow card, you get a ban for one game. If you get one red card, you get a ban for three games. Everyone knows where they are. So it should be the same with financial fair play. You break the rules, you get 10 points deducted. Everybody's the same. It doesn't matter. There's no there's no defence of that. You've broken As long as it's been proven they broke the rules, yeah. make the punishment the same for everyone. And then everyone knows where they are. You can't treat Bournemouth different to Man City or you can't treat Nottingham Forest different to Liverpool everyone's got to be treated the same it's one sport for everybody one set of rules for everybody and it needs to be sorted out it is mad that this, that Man City's charges haven't been um, resolved yet it's ridiculous really isn't it let's be honest it is, it is. It is. It is Richard and thank you very much indeed for your passion and Sean uh, for your uh, balanced view tonight and wish both of you and your clubs uh, all the best of course we will no doubt Speak again soon. Uh, refs up next, Hackett and Halsey. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? 
a woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, it's him. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. What are you well, going okay. up for? This is the Plank of the Week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good evening to you. Uh, welcome to the show. Uh, we're going to be looking at the uh, financial implications again in the second hour of the show tonight. Uh, we've got Six Nations Rugby with Nick Easter and George Shooter and then Angus Fraser and Neil Burns with us as we're sort of on the verge, aren't we, of the uh, third test match. It doesn't actually get underway until Thursday, but uh, what a series it's turning out to be uh, between India and England. All of that still to come uh, tonight. Um, let's have a chat with the referees, of course. And uh, as always, uh, Keith is with us. Good evening to you, Keith. And good evening as well to uh, Mark Halsey. Uh, Keith, just before you... I come to you, um, Mark, you, you look as if you you, th you fancy yourself. You haven't been refereeing today. What have you been doing? That looks like a, a coach's top. It is. I'm, I'm a manager of a veterans team out in uh, out in Spain on the Oliveira Costa. We're Oliveira Costa Veteranos. You can follow us on Facebook. And we had a great win today, one 0 So I'm very happy. But when you say <laughs> when you say a great win, was that against another of the uh, another good side? Yeah, another good side. Yeah, good referee as well today. So yeah, very good. Yeah, we're very happy today. I'm happy. And QPR got a draw, two two with Norwich. So I'm well happy. So you're, you're really happy then, aren't you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm happy. I, I tell you what, Keith. I'm going to come back to you now. I read newspapers yes. all the time, whether it's newspapers that are printed in the same building as this and portals or elsewhere and other things. I just noticed as soon as uh, there was the thought that sin bins and blue cards will be um, trialled elsewhere, that those that uh, like to pontificate on our great game think that this is just something we cannot see at all. We can't have blue sin bins in the uh, Premier League. And if we do, we have to have them only for certain things. You know, as per normal here, I often wonder whether some of these journalists are just sort of 
uh, saying it so that they don't get uh, barred from speaking to managers and things, rather than saying, we need something, whatever it is, to stop the amount of squealing and cheating and faking that is going on in our game. Yes, what we need, Mark, is stronger refereeing. Yeah. Uh, and we need the laws that are currently there to be applied more accurately. Mm. Sinbin works at grassroots level yeah. uh, because referees apply it with a lot of common sense. Um, there's no pressure other than if somebody has a real go, uh, then the, the Sinbin comes into effect. When we get to the uh, senior game, what has happened is that Referees' actions, the game as a whole, have devalued the yellow card. Mark will tell you, when we were in Europe, three yellow cards got the player a suspension. Yeah. What we've done is we've watered that down in England to five or six yellow cards before there's a suspension. And we've got referees, you know, we take Anthony Taylor, who's supposed to be our top referee, He's, uh, on average, generally issued three yellow cards, but a directive was put down at the beginning of this season to say we're going to be tougher. As a result, he's now on six yellow cards, average, mm. per game. And the yellow card is having zero effect. Mm. It's not mm. a punishment anymore. Yeah. It's not a deterrent anymore. Mm. So not. I think that when we, when we look at the blue card, I think the way that these announcements are made doesn't help the process at all. Well, I, think that, I, think it, I think it's right that FIFA and the IFAB take a line that says we've got to do something about dissent. Now, if they're going to do that, then experiment somewhere before they make the public announcements that give us all the impression that this is what's going to happen and then we get the Fiorari that says, yeah. why are we using cynical cards as well? Yeah, but why you are we see actually the, the, saying cynical? But the thing is, Keith, and the problem <laughs> is, Mark, is that uh, that's the deliberate way that those who run FIFA and UEFA, who would much prefer to be sitting next to those in the Middle East and enjoying the hospitality in America and everything else and, and whatever, then they don't really want any of this. That's why they do it like this. They're not interested because no. they want to just keep favour with players now who are cheating the whole time. And it's going down the league now. You know, there are goalkeepers now every single time, and all of them just going yeah. down when they're not injured, staying down yeah. for three or four minutes, not going right. off the field. Let's have a sin bin and an injury bin. Yeah, listen, look, I, I, I have to agree with Keith. I think also for me, this 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 blue card is, is absolute nonsense well, because why? that's what it, because because it's no different from from the from the yellow card. There's no different. So if you get a blue card, you go off for ten minutes, you yeah. come back on, you get another blue card, you're sent off. Yeah. So what's what's, what's the difference? Well, the difference so, is but, the difference is ten minutes off the pitch, ten minutes yeah. off the pitch with only but, ten but players. Then, but then what you'll get then is the game slow right down, delaying tactics, all this that you'll get, and you won't you'll get about in those ten minutes, you most probably get about four minutes of ball be in playing time. Well, because so, at the same uh, time listen, listen, I would listen, have listen, a clock. And also, and Keith is absolutely spot on, it's down to the standard of refereeing of okay. managing the game and managing the players. That's what it is. Well, and we've got to improve on our on, on the way we manage players, the way we but, engage with the players. That's I, the problem. Yeah, well, I understand this, and it's not down to you, but, I mean, I, I've been knocking down the door again for you, you guys to get into the PGMOL because what I want to see from referees in the first place, just two little things that um, annoy me. One is, as I've said, yeah. faking injury. Injuries, yeah, yeah. when they're real, are desperate. Yeah. We all know that. Yeah. But we all know that they're faking injuries. They know. There's a goalkeeper at the Abbey Stadium a couple of weeks ago who did it for about the last 15 minutes out of the last 25. I, and at the end of the game, he ran across to his fans and then to the, or, or the opposition, all of us as well, just sort of saying, hey, you know, I got away with yeah, it again. Yeah, but yeah. then our keeper go went and did the same last week yeah. away from home. They're all at it. And it's just yeah. an absolute nonsense. So I, I don't do really agree what? Let me tell you, sex. Mark. Go on. I, I think I think Mark. The answer to that is to is is to what rugby league do, 
And that is when a player's injured in rugby, yeah. the trainer comes on and yeah. treats okay. them. The game continues. So I think that we need to actually look and say, how can we avoid this you, Keith, time meeting? I'm gonna, Keith, on. I'm going to come back in for you straight away. And yeah. then I'll come back on that. But you see, the problem with football will be the keeper now will go down on the line. You won't be able to yeah. carry it on. You won't be able to trample all over the keeper. It's not the, you know, they won't, they're you clever. Can't. What they're also yeah. all doing, by the way, now, is that they all handle the ball when they kick the ball from hand. They're all outside the penalty box. Oh, correct. Oh. <laughs> but they you know, they're all continue to continue to do all of this and they get unless they get punishment. And the only way to punish these players is by giving them a card and then suspending yeah. them. If you don't do any you're of on, that, they'll carry on. You're on one today, Sags, aren't you, hey? Yeah, I just am. It's annoyed me. <laughs> it's annoyed me. It's annoyed me reading, you know, Martin in the Sunday Times yeah. and what's happening here? We don't need any of this. It'll ruin our football. It's ruining it for the fans right yeah. now. Just like, just like VAR agree. is. Just like VAR yeah. is at the moment. Yeah, you know, exactly. We saw two ridiculous handballs at Luton Town yesterday. Oh, and yeah. I've gone on oh. about it and gone on about it, about you know, what's natural, what's unnatural, what's what's natural for that certain phase of play. And those two penalties given at Luton yesterday, were, it was an absolute farce. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. I so agree. look, just I mean, calming down a bit as I am, we've spoken a lot about the bins and, and everything yes. like that. Uh, and, and, and I completely understand how it does work lower down and younger down as well. Of course it does. That is important. Yeah. But I, I still don't understand that if everybody doesn't want blue, we don't want the sin bin or whatever they're all talking about, is what do we want then? Because we still need something. And until the PGMOL come out and say, we need help in stopping cheating at the highest level, no one's going to yeah, get I mean, anywhere. Well, Mark. Well, they said Howard Webb went out pre-season to all the managers and said he was going to toughen up his referees on dissent. Yeah. It lasted six weeks. Yeah. The sin bin at grassroots level, I'll tell you what it does. It is effective because it's not only an individual punishment, it's a team punishment. Mm. And the team starts saying to the player, when he comes back on, keep your mouth shut. So it does have, at grassroots, a positive effect. Mm. What we've got at the Premier League level is, I go back to the point, we've got referees, I, I watch them, they're not in, incapable of managing a game, but they're all too soft. Mm. They're all trying to manage, but they're not managing at all because management yeah. is sugar and salt. It, it's a bit of like both. Let's be firmer with mm. these with these players because i mean i watched today the cheating that's going on is escalating mm. and referees mm. are just like i don't know i mean they're making life so so difficult one refreshing point here mark and i don't want to be too premature i've mentioned this guy before i watched sam barrett yesterday in a game in the premier league and for the first time this season there was a foul inside the penalty area. It didn't need VAR because he sold the decision. Mm. And and that's what you want with referees. And I, I just think that referees are allowing far too much dissent, crowding around, and they look weak and ineffective. And I think that the standard of refereeing is a worry because managers can't accept what's going on. The IFAB, I've got a job for them, yeah. sort out handball, yeah. And sort out VAR. I, I think that the game of football in particular, at the professional level now, in so many different ways, whether it's ex-footballers who come into punditry, some of them are brilliant, like Gary Neville, and others, yeah. some of them are useless. Um, yeah. You've got uh, referees now who want to be liked by those within football. So they're not actually making the decisions because they right. don't want these clubs to think that they're nasty individuals but they don't do their jobs properly. It's the same with commentators and other things. We've got so many people now just wanting to be part of the glory of this incredible game without upsetting anybody who is actually laughing behind all of these people's backs because they continue to cheat on and off the field, whether it's financial 
or whether it's through fouling or not fouling or faking or whatever they're doing, it's got to stop. Yeah, yeah. They're running out okay. of game mark. Yeah. That's I went up to one play. I went up to, I went up to a player in a game and I said, You go down easy today and you'll get absolutely nothing out of me. I'm yeah. telling you. Yeah. And do you know what? He went down once. Yeah. And I said, What did I tell you five minutes ago? And do you he know, didn't do it again. And do you know what, Keith? Again. One of the great things that has happened in football is that the medical side of things is so much better. Referees do not have to worry about a really serious injury anymore. Correct. We all know when it's a serious injury. Yeah. Yeah. And even if it's the odd one that isn't, it will be dealt with properly and swiftly in the right way because referees have always done it that way. Yes. And, and you're right. But I, I think effectively, we've just got to have a bit of courage at times to say, when he goes right. down, ignore him and just yeah. get on with the game. I tell you what, I, I, we haven't had long tonight couple of weeks' time, we're featuring the middle hour on a specific subject. We're going to do a referees panel. We'll invite Howard Webb. We'll invite somebody uh, else. Yeah. Well, yeah. no, we'll invite along with you yeah, guys yeah, and we'll get stuck in for an hour, whether there's red, <laughs> yellow, blue cards or what. Keith and Mark, as always, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. We're talking football thank finance you. next. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. at on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaking. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what <laughs> just happened. Ooh, whoa, listen. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? 
And with the gun culture, <laughs> in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, I mean, it's, a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. This is Talk TV. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on in the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument. We tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Cross Talk. One o'clock every weekday. Well, a very good evening to you, and uh, welcome to the show tonight. And uh, we are having one or two sound problems here. I hope it's not uh, getting in the way of uh, your uh, enjoyment of the show. And uh, I'm ever hopeful that two of my guests who we're having problems with... It's our end, by the way. It's our end. So um, we're going to be talking football finance in the next hour. We're going to be looking at Everton to start with. We're going to be looking uh, on from that at Nottingham Forest. And we're also going to be talking about Sheffield Wednesday. We'll touch on others as well in this middle hour of the Sunday Night Club. So, um, first of all, uh, Gavin Buckland, the Everton uh, statistician, is with us, and Kieran Maguire is also with us, and I'm hoping that Andrew uh, Mills will be with us uh, very shortly. So, uh, Kieran and Gavin, good evening to you. Hi, Mark. Yeah. Uh, Hi, Kieran. It's it's good. Hi, hi, Kevin. It's good to see both of you, Kieran. If I could come to you first, you know, the the prof with with all the answers as far as I'm concerned on on many things, and you know, we're we thought it's about time we we, we look back again at some of the things that have happened, and Everton, and we can talk about others too, but Everton, Sheffield Wednesday, and Forest. I just feel I feel so much for the fans of these clubs that are already being punished, and yet there are others who've done similar things, but in a more complex and complicated way, possibly or not, but it's still got to be proved or not. And yet there is sort of things hanging over both Everton and Forest, let's start there, with um, things to be decided in February and April, uh, Kieran. So just put us into context, uh, you know, how dire the situation could still be for both Forest and at this stage, Everton? Well, we know that Everton have been given a 10-point deduction, but they've appealed that. Uh, that. That appeal took place three days, just over a week ago. And I think we're expecting a response to the appeal, uh, a judgment on terms of the appeal coming out in the next week or two. I, I, I anticipate it being before the end of February. Um, then the Premier League, and I think this did surprise many people, it put through a second set of charges in respect of Everton for the three years ended the 30th of June 2023. And I think uh, Everton fans and other commentators have, have pointed out that this, this appears to be double jeopardy. Um, if you're being sanctioned for the three years to the 30th of June 2022, then it seems incongruous that you, you then subsequently do exactly the same. Now, it could be, um, and first of all, Everton could be you know, ultimately innocent until proven otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, it could be that if there is any sanction, um, any points already deducted will be subtracted from the tariff uh, if the worst happens, and they could end up with, with nothing. But uh, it, it is frustrating for fans. We, we don't fall in love with football due to spreadsheets and accountants and lawyers. Mm. Um, and uh, you, you can understand the, the, the disappointment uh, that the fans have put their faith in the owners. And I, and I do feel at times that some, the owners let them down um, through uh, not malevolence, but more to do with financial mismanagements and complacency and arrogance. And um, 
With Gavin uh, here, Gavin, if I could come to you now. I mean, there's this uh, sparkling new stadium that we're beginning to see pictures of down on the on the on the edge of the river. There, it absolutely looks fantastic. And yet, um, the real fans that are for me uh, up front and there for one reason only, they can't get into a football ground uh, basically unless they pay to get in to watch their side play. And yet the financial problems that the club are having could mean that it's all been wasted, particularly in a season like this one or others, if you basically get punished again and again and again. Yeah, and it's, it's okay. I'm saying there's lots of double jeopardy here. There's, I mean, you get the impression, I don't get into too much about the rules, that they never expected anybody to breach these rules when they, when they were brought in in 2013. And, and they've left... And nobody anticipated that once you breach them, what happens when you breach them in the following season? It wasn't really thought of in in, in the rules, and 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 the Premier League and, and the Premier League clubs have, have you know caught a cold on this, haven't they? Really, and you know you've got this ridiculous situation where I, I think I'm right. And it might go beyond the end of the season if there's an appeal against the second uh, second commission. And 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 you're right, Mark. People are just um, you know. It brings there's so much unease in football generally at the moment about lots of things. Mm -hmm. But for and it for supports of Evan and Nottingham Forest, it's just a great unknown, isn't it? You know, how many points have we got? How many points will we gain or perhaps lose? And also the clubs around us, mm -hmm. you know, both Evan and Forest are dangerously near the relegation zone or in it. And there's uncertainty if you're a Sheffield United fan, a Luton Town supporter, Crystal Palace fan. All those, all those clubs are affected as well, and it's not really the hit fight, the other, is it? No, it's and, and, and they, 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 they're the other supporters that we should be thinking about within all of this. Mm. Um, Andrew, uh, do join us, but I'm going to ask Kieran a, a question here now on this. That if I think back to Chelsea, and uh, I, I, I'm going to try and be careful here, when uh, Roman Abramovich was in charge of Chelsea and owned the club, he brought in players. He he seemed to do. Uh, what he wanted. I don't know whether uh, anything mattered in, in many ways to him. What I do know is that he has not uh, paid uh, at the moment all the money that he made out of the club that he promised was going to be going to charity and, and, and what have you. There are things. And we find out so much more about how never things don't seem to be straight in a lot of clubs. And yet it is those that are in trouble or unfashionable who uh, and seem not to have an army of lawyers that can do anything are the vulnerable ones here when it should be a level playing field, shouldn't it? As to, to you know, if you've done wrong, you're punished. You're absolutely right. It does appear that the new owners of Chelsea have effectively self-reported the club in respect of some allegations during the Abramovich regime. In terms of the 2.5 million, sorry, 2.5 billion pounds of proceeds that were, were generated from the sale of the club to the the Bowley Group, that money is still st stuck in a bank account. That money is frozen because there's now an argument in terms of how do you define the the victim of the conflict in Ukraine. Um, and, and that seems you know, crazy given you know, that there is so much hardship uh, taking place on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, in terms of a level playing field, well, um, under the proposed new rules that appear to be coming through in, in respect of cost control, those are going to be index linked because it will be uh, wages as a percentage of revenue. So if your money goes up, then your wages go up and your Everton are, are being uh, charged on a set of rules which came into being in 2013, as you rightly said, Mark. But we're now in you know, 2022, 2023. And if you index link uh, football revenues to that period, instead of £105 million allowable loss over three years, it, come, it works out as £216 million, in which case Everton would have been certainly within the rules and Forrest would have uh, as well, we, we highly anticipate. Um, Andrew, good evening and, and, and welcome to this. Uh, just one to you on all of this is that should there in some way, if it's not going to be sorted out fairly, I've got to think about the fans here on all of this every time. Not, not the players, not the owners, not the directors, not the other things, just the people that work and have earned money out of the club because they're caterers or taxes firms or whatever, who perhaps will be the first to, to miss out and lose out if a club goes under or, or whatever. 
Why, why is it we can't perhaps now just have a complete amnesty and start again? Because I don't see any, any other way of it being fair. Because unfortunately, Mark, uh, as, as much as that might be, uh, might be the most sensible route with hindsight to look at it, the reality is the rules were put in place. The rules have been breached. I, I totally agree with what Kieran's saying. But if you go back to um, when, when Blackburn were, were owned previously before the, the Venkies, the, the chairman, who was an exceptional uh, supporter of that football club, left £4 million in the 90s, which seemed to him to be you know, a fair amount a fair amount of money to keep the football club going. Well, we now know that that could be a monthly a monthly wage bill. So I, I'd always said, and I've always said to any board of directors I've ever worked for, that, that standing still in football is going backwards. The Premier League moves forwards and it moves forwards at a pace every single week. So you, you really can't put something in place and then not have an adjustment and not have uh, uh, the ability to kind of take a look at what that means in today's money. And, and there, therefore lies the problem, Mark, is, you know, it's very dull, it's very complicated, and we've got to find a better way of allowing supporters to, to, to enjoy the experience. Because the one thing that, that, that has been a constant throughout my time in football is, is this, this wish to protect the integrity of the competition. Mm. Well, where are we now with that? Because, because yesterday I was watching football thinking, I, I don't know what this result means. I genuinely don't. Sheffield United, fantastic, beat Luton. What does it mean? I don't know because I don't know what's coming for these clubs that are under investigation. Yeah, you're absolutely yeah. right. And, and really, um, it, it, Gavin, with, with you and with Everton uh, and where you are, I mean, everything is just so much on the hold. And it, uh, I don't know how, how, it, how it plays out. A lot of the people that have been involved in this are no longer there, are they? Yeah. anymore i mean it's it's just it all it punishes really are the people who whether they've done it through the turnstiles or because they've got sky television or they've paid money on other ways towards this club without a fan the club is absolutely nothing because you could play all you like without fans but if you yeah. don't have an income that's through the fans in the first place, as we've said, by all the different ways they can buy into it, there's no game. No, absolutely. I mean, I know what you're saying about, you know, you can't punish the fans, but if the Everton board or probably Narrow Town to Machiri hadn't been so gung-ho with their spend and the lack of controls around it over several years, then, you know, in reality... They are the ones who've got us into this position, haven't they, of the club? You can, you can say the Premier League's punishing the fans or the, a commission's punishing the fans. Mm. But in reality, if Everton, if the Everton board or the Everton owner in particular had behaved in a responsible way, we wouldn't be in this position now, would we? And, and that, that's the way I, I look at things, really. Yeah. You know, I, I, they, 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 the clubs make the rules, Mark, don't they? You yeah. know, the, the, the rules are signed off in 2013. Of the 14 clubs, I think, voted for it, Everton were one of them. So, you know, it's not something that we didn't disagree with. It, and, and and I think some of it lost in this, and I'm not defending the Premier League or the Commission here. What I'm saying is, as a, as a fan, I I want I wanted my board and my owner to act responsible. You know, that they, they are the they are looking after the club, aren't they, on our behalf? And they, they obviously didn't. One of the real problems, Kieran, for me is, is not just the financial implications that we're talking about here. It's everything from private equity to who's coming in to buy these clubs to what sort of rights we're getting, who's getting the money for this and that. Basically, they're in danger of complete... I mean, they, they're all so jealous around the world of what we have with the Premier League, but it is our league but it's a world league and it's the best world league at the moment because it's got more fans and supporters than anybody else. And yet nobody's playing by any sort of rules, obviously. Well, I, I, I'm inclined to agree in, in the sense that the rules were brought in with, I think, a, a, a modicum of common sense in this, uh, because football, the co cost control had got out of hand. 
um, but there has been no appropriate monitoring. There, there's been no uh, desire to to move with the times, and, and that has very much discriminated against what you might call ambitious or aspirational clubs that, who have had new owners over the course of the last decade. And I include Everton there, and, and, and I understand, you know, absolutely understand where mm. Gavin has come from. Mm. Farhad Mishiri um, came in a, a bit like a new lottery winner and, and splashed the cash. He splashed a lot of it. He didn't splash it particularly well, and, and the fans have been the ones on on the on the receiving end of that because it's the uncertainty. You know, at least when I go to a match and I and I see my team win or lose, and, and you know, I'm a Brighton fan. We lost in the 96th minute yesterday. Yeah. Didn't like it, but I. That's that's football, and you accept it. I think the frustrating thing for Everton fans and for Forest fans, and also Gavin rightly said, all of those fans in the clubs around because they don't know whether we should be going for a win or a draw for a particular match because you don't know the outcome of what's going to happen to to Everton and Forest. So the rules, I think, are flawed from a from a person who's sort of vaguely involved in finance. Mm. Um, but in addition to that, it does create huge uncertainties uh, for for people. And we go to watch football to forget about money, to forget about finance, mm. to forget about the drudgery of life. It's our one big escape route um, as fun, uh, fans. And you spend as much time these days talking to your mates in the pub beforehand and at half time when you're supposed to be having a quiet pint and enjoying life, uh, talking about mm. amortisation and financial fair play and cost control and commissions. That's not football. No. Yeah, absolutely right. Kieran and uh, Andrew have got plenty more to speak about in this hour. We're going on to Forest next. Just a final word at this stage, Gavin, with you and the fans. Is, 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 this limbo is torture, isn't it? Uh, that's just on the pitch, Mark, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> I think um, off the pitch is equally more torturous. And we don't want to get into talking about the, the ownership issue with Evan. Mm -hmm. Do we really? You, you 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 put it right there. You said uncertainty. That that's the key thing, isn't it? And nobody likes uncertainty, whether you're a, a you know a business owner or a fan or whoever. And, and it, it's it's that uncertainty at the moment. That's just it's just never ending, is it? And and will not be not be known. I think in full for the several months now. Gavin Buckland, thank you very much indeed for uh, joining us in this first part. Andrew and Kieran staying with us throughout the hour. Uh, we're going to speak. Uh, more about Forest next. Des Oldman will be joining us as well. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh. It's carry on. What just <laughs> happened? Ooh, whoa, listen. 
it may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm Problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. What are you well, going okay. up for? This is the point of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it UnpopCon. Really. <laughs> um, Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the new conservatives, the ERG, the common sense research group, the red wall, red trouser, popcorn. I mean, popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun, so, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Very good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, if you're just joining us tonight here on the Sunday Nightclub, you've missed the first of uh, three parts in this middle hour about uh, financial fair play within football and the problems for the likes of Everton. We're talking Forest now, we'll be talking Sheffield Wednesday next. And uh, I've got a great team. Uh, alongside me here but it will be past, part of our second podcast of the week uh, which will be uh, on Wednesday this particular feature uh, in all its details and one or two other bits and pieces as well uh, will be out by Wednesday back of the stand on all of the podcast platforms and uh, uh, it's a new venture and we hope that you are enjoying it uh, we'll come to Andrew Mills in a moment. Des Oldham, the Forest blogger, joins us as well. But first of all, uh, Kieran Maguire, when we're talking about Nottingham Forest. I think, what, for me, Kieran, with this one, is that uh, here's a club in Nottingham Forest that needed to spend money that would be a problem in some ways for them to be able to compete in any way in the Premier League as opposed to when they'd been down in the Championship. They had this little jewel in the crown, of course, Brennan Johnson, that they could have sold within the time scale of the three years to not go over the threshold of 105 million. But they knew that everybody else knew that and that they would get a lot more if they were just able to, well, they did break the rules, but to, to get what was worth somebody who'd been with the club all the way through and get a maximum amount of money, 47.5 million, which means that they... Uh, are under the threshold, even though they're out of time with three months and, and what have you. Well, you see, where does all this sit? Because this is the other big problem, isn't it? You nearly feel that the cartel at the top of the Premier League, not only can they um, break the rules or there is suspicions that they've broken the rules, but they can make sure as well that others will definitely break the rules because they won't be able to compete with them. You're absolutely right, Mark. If we actually take a look at the data, when Nottingham Forest were promoted at the end of 2022, the total cost of their squad, all of the players put together, came to £12 million. Now, we have three clubs in the Premier League, Manchester City, Manchester United and Chelsea, who have squads that have cost more than £1 billion, i.e. Forest went up with a squad which cost 1% of that of the uh, of, of the elite clubs at the top and in addition they were only allowed to lose 61 million pounds over three years instead of 105 because under the way that the rules have been put together for every season in the championship you can only lose 13 million and for every season in the premier league it's 35 so th they're coming up 
with with one hand tied behind their back and then the Premier League ties another hand behind their back and in relation to Brendan Johnson and personally I still wish he was at Forest as uh, mm. uh, as he scored the winning goal for Spurs yesterday <laughs> um but as as far as the player was concerned this this is the lunacy of the rules in the sense that we've seen some clubs being forced to sell players on the 30th of June to try to comply with uh, with with the cost control rules um, in order to be within the threshold and therefore they've had to sell those those players at a discount uh, and Forrest themselves admitted if they'd sold Brennan Johnson on the 30th of June they'd have got 30 million instead of 47 and a half how can a club you know, having to forego seventeen and a half million pounds when it has achieved you know, its main aim of, of uh, staying in the Premier League in the first season, how can the club be penalised to that extent by accountants and lawyers and uh, and the suits? Uh, I'll come to you, Andrew, in a moment. Des, I just want to welcome you to the programme. I mean, this is a frustrating side of all of this for Forest, and you're, I, I believe going to be waiting to, till towards the end of this season now before you'll actually know your fate it is mark it's extremely frustrating looking look, looking at what kieran says there listening to what he's saying that forest uh, were already sort of behind the eight ball so to speak coming out of the championship because the way it happened as well they were languishing around the bottom it was a little bit of a miracle you know it, it was always going to be hard to compete and whilst the rules do seem a little bit unfair, there's a little bit of frustration as well for myself in the way the club's been run. We signed all those players. A lot of them was a waste of money in reality. You know, we signed 44 players since we got promoted. And, and you can't put that many players on a football pitch over a season. So a lot of it seems like wasted money. And then there was issues around shirt sponsors and things like that. So there's potentially a little bit of arrogance. What frustrates me as a fan, this news came out just after we'd beat Newcastle and Manchester United and everybody starts looking up and confident we'd stay in the Premier League. And then the news hits you and and since then we've gone back into a slump. We're looking over our shoulder and if, if we get points taken away, mm. um, whether it's fair or unfair, it's going to really sort of hit us hard and be a real struggle to stay in the Premier League based on what's happening with FFP. Uh, the, the more we hear about all of this, Andrew, as well, the more... Um... I would like an an open meeting of which we'll never have, of course, of the owners of the Premier League when they sit down together uh, with their chief executive and everything. There must be a lot of laughing going on as to what happens to some of these clubs coming up as far as they're concerned. There's a there's a despicable thought of uh, uh, for me, possibly, but I don't think it is despicable that these people don't care at all about the league. They only care that they know they can get away with it because they're basically in control. Well, of course, I mean, the reality, Mark, is that, that they're not seeing it as, as anybody would from the outside or, or, or that looks at it independently. Um, what I would be seriously concerned about and what I was seriously concerned about throughout my time as a, as a chief executive was, was the want to retain the status quo, the want to make the bridge really, really long and arduous and 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 this is doing exactly that what it is it's actually it's actually creating kind of financial doping through circumstance because mm -hmm. yes i would agree that that, that forest spending um and of which i think it was in, in the region of 150 million pounds was 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 way beyond what was needed um however they probably did that on the basis of feeling that that was the squad they needed to stay in the division um, and in itself then creates a problem. And, and again, if we look at, as, as Kieran said, if we look at um, Brennan Johnson and, and them losing, you, you know, uh, significant sums of money, well, the sums of money that they lost are going to pale into insignificance of the money that they'll lose if they actually uh, adopt points. But again, this is, this, is, this is financial doping by independent parties. It's, it's, they're, almost, they're almost being manoeuvred to fail. Um, unless, unless, by hook or by crook, they're able to achieve um, to achieve a squad good enough to stay in the Premier League for the sums of money that that wouldn't put them foul of the the regulations, and it just doesn't work. No, um, it, Kieran, this does, this sounds silly and everything. Is there any way that a club, you know, thinking of this, that knows that even if they're they're going to get a season in the Premier League or whatever, or they they might not, and they've They've got all this ridiculous thing. Is there any way they could become a charitable trust? 
there anything like that they can do to sort out uh, the, the, the big boys who don't care for any of them who sit around that boardroom? I'm, I'm a teacher rather than a lawyer, but I, I don't think that that would work um, I, I, unless you, you're going to have to get an awful lot of people from an awful lot of independent sources to provide funding. So I, I don't see how that could be successful. Um, having a billionaire owner does help. And, and you know, Mr. Mar Marikanakis has been a very generous benefactor to, yeah. to Nottingham Forest. Um, you know, I, I think, as it already been said, uh, the quantity of players... Uh, signed has, has been eyebrow raising on a qualitative basis there have been flaws but they did retain their Premier League status last season mm. and it's only the second time in about the last 15 years that that has been the case where all three teams that have mm. gone up have managed to avoid coming down straight away again but it is an expensive uh, enterprise if you're going to try to do that and one other thing with all of this that we we tend to forget about as well if they lose these points and they go down uh, the footballers can, you know, they can ride the wave. They, if they, if they haven't been stupid with their money, they, they'll have made enough money to to look after themselves, and they'll they'll get a move if they want one or not. Uh, the board, as you've mentioned, you know, they're in a reasonable position, and it's the people that work for the club, those from um, the media side of things, that will be cut again, from the catering side of things, that will be cut again those that perhaps rely on them and the businesses around the club they might all lose an awful lot more they might be owed money that that still hasn't been paid to them and everything that they they never see in in the same way there is basically it seems to me that football clubs now are owned by people who do not give a jot for the people in the community that they're making their money out of I agree. You know, a, a football club is part of your identity. It's part of the history and the heritage of that town or city. Um, Nottingham Forest have won the European Cup on, on two occasions, and it was a magnificent achievement. Uh, they're now in their second season in their Premier League. Well, when they were promoted in the 70s, in their second season, they won the top division because it was possible in those days to to take such an approach, you know, to be competitive with the big boys. Now, that that those days are, are sadly... Um, way beyond us and, and I'm not old enough to remember Forest, Derby County, Everton, Aston Villa, Blackburn, Leeds United you know, all of these clubs who if we're honest will never win the Premier League again and, and I think that's sad for football um, because such is the focus on the larger clubs and the, the, the way that the, the non-elite big six who who just happened to be in the right place at the right time have been have been put in such a position of power, and the other clubs have been marginalised. Uh, you know, it, it's now it's it's t treated as a great achievement if you finish seventh or eighth in in the top yeah. division. If you take a look at Spurs, though, their first ten years in the Premier League, their average position was tenth, and their highest position was fifth, and yet they're supposed to be one of the clubs to which we aspire to. Now, as a business, Spurs are absolutely fantastic, mm. but in terms of a trophy-winning club, you know, mm. their fans aren't necessarily happy about that. No, that's good points that you make. Um, as far as you're concerned, Des, and, and, and what you, from those around you, the fans and everything, um, you know, this contemplation that we might, you might get to within a month of the end of the season, or even closer than that, if it's late April that you, you get to know, that the whole season, it's been a waste of everything. All of it. Your time, your money, your opportunities, what you've done, what you've had to do, what you've bought, what you've, what you've sacrificed otherwise, for something that's been taken away from you by big boys deciding that they don't want you to become any bigger. And that's exactly it, Mark. That's where the frustration comes in. Firstly, that the rules aren't equal and we're not on the same playing field from the start. But but also from the club's point of view, and you, as a fan, you invest a lot of time, effort, your own money, you know, on a much smaller scale, of course. But it's it's then going to games and, and doing what you have to do to be a part of it and experiencing the highs. And, and that's what I was touching on before about those two victories. If we've got six points taken off, for example... And we get relegated for an administration issue rather than footballing reasons, then it, it, it's almost like you might lose a bit of faith in your club and might lose a bit of faith in football and the Premier League and ever wanting to sort of be part of that again. It, it's a brutal place, the Premier League. We've been back. We we 
clamoured for it for years and years and years. It took us 23 years to get back. And, and, and since we've been there, we've just found it, it's tough. It, it's really hard to compete, even on a game-by-game, 90-minute basis, you know, with some of these big boys who have got so many advantages that are not, that, that should be ironed out. I know what they're saying about about you can lose so many as many years you've been in the Premier League. But um, at the start of August, you should all start from the same playing field. You should be able to spend the same money. You should be able to mm. do the same things because it's a competition. You can't start a competition with rules sort of all over the place. And Man City can do this, and Everton and Forest can do this. It, it just it just shouldn't work like that. And then again, it's the fans that suffer again, isn't it? it always everything, whether it's VAR or all these rules they put in. Ultimately, see, it's the fans of the clubs that yeah. suffer. See, the other thing, Andrew, with this, and, and, and you'll know this only too well, and we'll, we'll come on and talk about it in the, in the last part as well, but, you, you know, the, the, there are clubs here that can do what they want, basically, can't they? And seemingly get away with it. Whereas, uh, you know, this, this, this tawdry idea that if you break a rule 105 times, it's going to take 10 years to decide your fate. Um, just, just look at two or three of them. And, and book them uh, as they would do you or me for speeding or something like that and get on with it. Yeah, look, I think, I think, um, I think, you know, the, the, the misapprehension is, is that Premier League chief executive chairman, board of directors are, are working against kind of other clubs or working against particular clubs coming up or, or, or trying to skew the trying to skew the the the, um, uh, the balance in their favor they're not they're they're, they're just in, incredibly focused on their own position which means they don't take into account that where the rules leave everybody else but they're, they're in a they're in a somewhat uh, invidious a new word I've learned invidious position I think however that that doesn't give you an excuse to allow it to continue. Now, the, the problem that they know that we've all got, because we're all addicted to this thing we call football, is that the reality is, if I told you, uh, Des, that this was the situation, this is, uh, this is going to be the difficulties that you're going to face, it's going to be incredibly difficult to actually try and achieve that, do you want to still take the chance? I'd suggest that 99.9% .9 of fans, whether it be Nottingham Forest, Brighton, Tottenham, Brentford or whoever, would say, yeah, go on. Let's let's flick the coin. Let's spin it. And they know that, Mark. The the the, the regulators know mm. that. So they know that they've got a willing audience already addicted to the product. Mm. So the reality is that before anybody actually says, "Hang on a second, let's just look at these rules. Let's look at what that means to us. Let's look at what that means to football league clubs trying to aspire to come up." Before they've done that, everybody said, "Yeah, I'm in. I'll have a go." And so all of a sudden. It detracts from the reality of, as I said, the status quo remains the same. Yeah. Uh, Andrew and Kieran staying with us. Um, thank you very much indeed, Des, for your thoughts on Nottingham Forest at this stage. We're going to look at Sheffield Wednesday uh, next. And uh, that uh, is a different type of story, but still very much part of everything that we're talking about. And I'll just float this out there for all of you. If you've perhaps not even gone on a family holiday because the kids want to see Nottingham Forest or someone like that in the Premier League for a season. You've managed to buy tickets every game or season tickets for all of you and you've denied yourself other things and yet they still go down. Uh, do you think that was money well spent because we enjoyed the season or is it, you know what, we've just wasted something that hasn't been real anyway? How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. Really? All this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> Three, two, one. Uh, go, Grams. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? The 
woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever, I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on. <laughs> what just happened? <laughs> Whoa, listen! <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you have to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is Plank of the Week, Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, mm -hmm. can it? Yeah. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Because... Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, a very good evening to you, and I know a lot of you uh, are finding it really informative with uh, our superb guests that we have, Kieran Maguire, who's absolutely brilliant on all of this on uh, so many different platforms, and of course, um, Kieran uh, is uh, with us, Andrew Mills, who's been a chief executive at uh, Brentford and has been very much part of football over many, many seasons, and uh, Sheffield Wednesday, one of our great clubs, uh, of course, that has had uh, all sorts of problems and protests and everything else going on with their... Uh, uh, owners at the moment and uh, you know for uh, their owner whose family the Chansey family of course and everything else uh, that were involved in all of this have uh, uh, the world's biggest uh, canning of tuna fish well the only pe person that's been on the hook here have been the Sheffield Wednesday fans because it's been a nightmare from start to finish for them so Kieran uh, is with a Kieran you th this set of wonderful stuff uh, and we're going to talk about this first of all. Uh, Dan, thank you for joining us, and uh, and Andrew's still with us as well. Um, you know, they sold. I mean, this this bit, Kieran, that that you put. You know, they over the last decade-ish, as you put uh, on your excellent tweet, um, the club now has accumulated losses of 132 million, despite selling the stadium to the owner, 38 million pound profit. It's unbelievable, isn't it, really? I think it is a, a function of modern football and the, the challenges, uh, especially if you are trying to get into the Premier League. And Mr. Chancery, 
he he has put his money where his mouth is for a few years mm -hmm. before he, he appeared to turn off the taps. And it means that Sheffield Wednesday and Sheffield Wednesday fans have suffered. Yeah, there's been points deductions. We have the position now where Sheffield Wednesday has lost an awful lot of money. The club no longer owns Hillsborough. It's paying £50,000 a week in rent to the owner for the stadium, which has been the home of, of Owls fans since the day they first went to the match with their, their mum, their dad, their uncle, their grands, their parents or whoever it was. So I think it is indicative of... of the, the real financial hardship that exists outside of the Premier League. We saw Derby County lose £200 million under their owner before the club went into administration. So, so you know, Sheffield Wednesday is not alone. I think it's indicative of just how tough it is. Um, and uh, a, a Wednesday fan asked me to, to summarise the numbers. So... I, I put together a bit of a, a scribble on uh, on social media. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's it's really good looking at, at, at everything from net debt to gross squad costs over the all the years from 2011. It's it's fantastic. Uh, before I come to you, Andrew, I, I mentioned Dan Fudge. The Wednesday week is with us, Dan. I mean, where are you exactly as a, a fan base and thinking at the moment? Because there've been protests this weekend uh, again with your early game this weekend and what have you. But it, it must get just so frustrating and tiring that you're turning up to watch a football club and your team, but, you know, that it, it's never-ending uh, what you're having to do. It, it really is. And, and, and there's, like, like I mentioned, I think it was last week when I, when I was on this show, there's, uh, there's the group, the, uh, the Club 1867 group, and they've, uh, over the last few months, they've really started to gather pace because I think a lot of the Sheffield Wednesday fans are starting to realise that for a number of years, for, for a quarter of a century now, uh, you know, they've been coming in, they've been paying their money, they've been turning up. We've still got some of the highest, highest attendances in the league, uh, but we don't seem to be getting rewarded with anything. But, you know, at one point we did have um, our day out at, uh, at Wembley that we unfortunately lost to Hall in 2016. Then we got to the playoffs again the following year. But I'm just looking now at, at Kieran's uh, fantastic p &L that he's uh, that, he, that he whipped up on a whim. Apparently, <laughs> that, that that's really impressive. And uh, and looking at some of the wages on that on that sheet, they're they're astronomical. Yeah. And uh, and and I feel like what we are we're in a world where just like you say, Mark, we've got these we've got this universe of other clubs that don't have parachute payments trying to keep up and to try and come up with these new innovative ways to make money but also coupled with the fact that our uh, that our chairman's not the uh, not the best chairman in the football league to put it lightly no it's a good point that you make andrew um a, a lot of people uh, texting us uh, tonight and tweeting us as well keep them coming in because uh, we always look at all of them on this show uh, is that um why no why no cap on salaries why what is the problem of having a salary cap i've never understood this i mean the nfl have a salary cap and others you know we follow america 20 years later with with big riches and everything for players and i understand all of that but if a player who's on i don't know uh three four hundred thousand pounds a week and it gets cut down to a hundred thousand pounds a week for all of them well take it or leave it go and find somewhere else that you're going to get that you might get it in the Middle East, but you won't be enjoying your football. Why don't they? Why don't they? Why don't? Why don't they play the game of, of, uh, of challenge against these agents and these players, and and get things back to, um, some sort of sanity. Well, as I told a, a, a group of chairmen some years ago at uh, the Football League conference, having been on both sides of that table, just say no. I mean, quite literally, draw the line yourselves. The problem therein lies is that a number of chairmen along along the line don't want to be curtailed um, to take their opportunity to push their club towards what they see as as the promised land in the Premier League. And so you never really get uh, the numbers of, that you need to say no, because you're always going to have a couple of clubs that feel like their circumstance is different and that actually they're not hampered by these rules and regulations. The reality of of, of, you know, I would say that I would say if you look over the conversation of the last hour, the reality of that is that the model itself is broken. Mm. We've said this before: the model is broken, and and it's really, really difficult to try and now find a one-size-fits-all panacea that fixes all of the issues. Mm. What what we've always said is that doesn't excuse trying to or not trying to, and and therein lies the problem: is that 
you know, you need you need you need 75 percent of any division to change any rules before you start looking at, at, at going across the other divisions. And you just don't get it because there's an independent want for for uh, for somebody to look uh, at their own football club and, and feel that their own but, football club isn't going to be in this situation. I, well, it I, is. Everybody can be where Sheffield I, Wednesday I, is now. I understand all of that, Andrew. But Kieran, uh, what I no one ever takes anybody on in any of this, do they? Because look at look at where the financial situation is. We've we've had a, a conservative government that have lied their way through most things, and football has been one of them, and pushed down the road as far as they can, and it's not going to happen before. Um, there is uh, going to be the next election anyway. Um, so, you know, all of these things are, oh, we just will look at that and we'll get something sorted and then we'll be able to do it all. Why, doesn't, why don't the Premier League, of course they won't, but why doesn't football, the football uh, in this country say, right, you know what, we are having in this country, in law, because the independent regulator who's in government or whatever we're going to make a law that we are going to have a salary cap and if that salary cap is 150,000 pounds a week or 100,000 pounds a week in the premier league so be it most of most of it seemingly for me is wasted by a lot of these players and and their agents and everybody else anyway kieran so um, you, you know i just don't understand why we don't somehow get on with it i think everybody acts in terms of self interest um, the, the Premier League and the EFL have had years of opportunity uh, collectively and individually as organisations to, to determine a set of cost control rules. We do, we do have a salary cap as far as League One and League Two mm. is concerned. Um, in League One, it's 60% of revenue and in League Two, it's 50% of revenue. But then there's an additional rule that if the owners put in money, uh, for every pound that the owners put in in the form of equity, you can spend an extra pound on wages. So, so as Andrew was saying, you only need two or three. They're not even rogue owners. No. They, they say, I've got a lot of money. I'm ambitious. I want to see the club get promoted. And therefore, they add the rocket boosters. We've seen similar in terms of what happened with Roman Abramovich and Sheikh Mansour when they came into the Premier League and there were no cost control rules. They said, well, let's treat this as a trophy asset. I'm not interested in, in how much the players get paid. I just want to win trophies. Yeah. You don't see any Manchester City or, or Chelsea fans complaining as a result of that. And, and indeed, those two clubs played each other in the 2021 Champions League, which is a testament to, to not having cost control. You, you tell me a single Manchester Manchester City fan or Chelsea fan or or a member of staff who was unhappy at being in that final with the exception of the fact that it was taking place during COVID and the fans couldn't physically attend. So we, we have this, this paradox that as individual fans of individual clubs, you want your club to spend as much money as possible because sustainability is not why we fell in love with football, mm -hmm. uh, even though collectively we, we know it's probably for the greater good of the game. Uh, one of the other things, Andrew, uh, the, the problem for me with all of this, I mean, I sat down once a month with Bruce Buck when he was chair of uh, Chelsea Football Club just to learn more about things and what have you, very much at the time with Jose Mourinho and Roman Abramovich. And the one thing he always said to me every time we met was, it's never about the money. There is always money. He will spend as much as he wants. He doesn't care selling shirts. He has the money. We want to win. And with that sort of thought, uh, you're never going to win if you're other clubs that can't compete with that. Well, no, as Kieran suggested, it, it, it's it's uh, simply not in their interest or simply not in the individual interest. But we want a fair, However, fairer playing field, don't we? we yeah, certainly. And, and, and that's what... I mean, that's what they're trying to achieve in some regards without risking themselves. So, yes, everybody suggests they want a fairer playing field, but not, not at their own cost. But what I would say um, is that what we are seeing and what we have seen in January is absolutely a result of these clubs kind of being docked points, uh, exa absolutely a result of, of profit and sustainability rules. So it is trickling, trickling. Right, I'm going to come in and I want you to say that because that's a really good point that you've you made. But why then? They, the only reason they've, they've not overspent in this January transfer window because they are worried suddenly that points will be deducted from them. 
But these top clubs won't be thinking quite so much about that next time because Manchester City's going to get away with it for 10, 15, 20 years. It's the Charles Dickens bleak house of this football area and, and time. You know, they don't care. They're 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 100 lawyers. Push it all down the line. It's never going to happen. We just need somebody to take control of this blooming league and say, right, if you want to play football in this country and you own this, we are going to make sure, it has to be government, that we'll pass a law that you can only get this amount for uh, salaries and this amount for other things, and the debt then wouldn't be a problem. It I think you're throwing your hat in the ring there, Mark. Sorry, Kieran? I think you're throwing your hat in the ring there, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> but sorry, Andrew, as well. No, it absolutely has to be an independent uh, regulator that, that, that will do that because you're just not going to get it from the clubs themselves. Because, again, for, for a large percentage of, of the league, they, they, didn't, they haven't had to operate under those rules. And so, actually, they've built up a business and a war chest that means this doesn't affect them. That's without the individual people that are and and have the ability to to mm -hmm. to uh, finance these businesses and again should we have any issue if somebody has has the money to back that up well not really i mean it just means that that, that somebody's more fortunate than 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 the other but you know the reality is there is a trickle effect it is it is having some effect and again i think we have to celebrate some effect rather than no effect however we also have to learn from the likes of sheffield wednesday the likes of reading the likes of nottingham forest and all these other clubs and, and try and ensure that the that the rules and regulations are constantly constantly moving yeah. to take into account uh, the, uh, the circumstance 30 seconds uh, sheffield wednesday and uh, where we go then does I, 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 don't, I don't know where we go from here. The fans have been very loud. They've been, they've been sh voicing their discontent. And I don't know where it's going to go because we've seen these, these clubs get, these, get rid of their chairman. They get a new one in. And, you know, they've not always been better every time. I know our chairman's got a few quid, so I'm kind of on the fence with it. But I don't, I don't know where we go from here because if we, if we spend our money, we support our club. If we don't spend our money, the club falls away. So what do we do? We don't get that time with our family, our friends, going to the football anymore. Dan, thank you very much indeed. Kieran, you've been brilliant as always. Andrew, thanks for your thoughts too. That was our middle hour. We're doing something different every week. Want to get to grips with the stories that really matter? To cut through the spin and the BS. Want unvarnished and fiery debate? Then join us for Crosstalk. One o'clock every weekday. at eight on Talk TV. This is Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of a street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. 
It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen. <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk CV. It's the only place where you get the truth. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> well, this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs>
uh, two two unconvincing wins out of two, uh, they'd probably take that right now. They just need to need to certainly improve on uh, some some key areas of the game. I think. Yeah, I think. Uh, it, well, of course you're right uh, with what you say, George. Nick as well. Just with a thought, I'll come back to you on England. But I first want to ask you a little bit. It's a young Welsh side, isn't it? They'll be a little frustrated with uh, what they've done as well. But a, a performance that will they'll learn so much from that. They will learn a lot. Um, very, very young, in a in a similar rebuilding phase to England. Not got the seniority that England have. You know, the splash in the front row of the likes of Marla Cole and Itoji and George and what have you. But um, they'll learn a lot, and um, that was my concern yesterday. I was that the game is you know no expectation on the Welsh. They weren't expected to win. Um, and if England weren't to win, it would probably be the sort of mental side of the expectation to win at home that might have cost them. But I'm glad we got through. You know, you don't like to lose to the Welsh because suddenly all your friends are Welsh or, you know, acquaintances, shall we say. Um, they, they come out of the woodwork and, and they like to let you know about it. But, you know, as George says, you know, it's progress. is two from two. You know, still on, we're still on for the Grand Slam. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, when was the last time this England side had a significant victory against the team ranked higher than them? Um, so that's the question leading into the rest of the Six Nations. From Wales' point of view, going back to your original question, Saggers, um, they will learn a lot from it, but you've mm -hmm. got to win. You've got to win in Test Match Rugby, and Warren Gatlin's a winner, and he'll be he'll be disappointed they let, they let England off the hook, and they they next have, um, they now next go to Ireland in mm -hmm. Dublin, and uh, as we know, Ireland are the number one side in the world, and you know, they've got two weeks to prepare for that with a young side. I can't see them getting much out of that. So the pressure will be on, despite the fact they're a young side in a transitional period. So what does uh, Steve Borthwick take away from all of that? Um, we, we've heard him already, you know, talk, you know, important that they won. We did win, proud of that. Managed to get a, across uh, the line just uh, against the side, but what 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 does he still have to shape and do? Nick, I'll come to you first, and then George to you afterwards. Well, I think they need to get a lot, a lot more alacrity, a lot more cohesion with their attacking game. Um, I like what they're doing defensively. I mean, that was sort of all over the place the last two or three years. You know, the tail end of Eddie and and last year, and it wasn't really the English. You know, it's been a a hallmark of the England game, that along with set piece. But we've known that for a long time. And what's always frustrated England fans is, you know, our ability with the ball. And, you know, having a balance of the game. Um, we obviously had too much balance of a kicking game in the World Cup. Steve's, you know, it's very much in Steve's sort of MO to do that, you know, given where he's coached before. But he understands the modern game with, you know, so France and Ireland and the All Blacks, you know, the, what you know, you've got to put points on the board. And he selected a form side. He selected good players. George spoke about, you know, a couple of Northampton lads playing well, you know, Tommy Freeman, Fraser Dingwall. But where England really lack, and they'll hope that a few guys come back from injury, is some go forward, some power. Um, because it's okay having ball players and guys that want to attack and are willing to attack. But if you don't have the ability in in tight international defences to get over the game line and get quick balls, so someone like Ollie Lawrence. I'm not sure of his injury status, but he was in the squad and was pulled for the first two games. Someone like him, you know, they need these big ball carriers mm -hmm. to be able to create that space for our attacking game to thrive. Uh, and George, of course, at, at the stage, as Nick was saying there, that uh, Steve Borthwick is with this squad. Um, a win's a win, which is important, even if there is still an awful lot to do. How does he, how does he blend that in... The, in the rest of this uh, championship now against uh, the better sides? Well, you know, the, the, the winning part is very important for the squad. I think, you know, if, if you're losing and playing poorly, it can be a very debilitating place to be. Uh, you know, the press on your back, people like us are chirping on Sunday night TV about how rubbish everything is. Uh, so if you're losing these games uh, and, and playing badly, that can be quite bad quite bad for morale, quite bad for confidence. So I think Borthwick will use the wins. He'll use those, the wins, uh, I'm talking wins in, in terms of the fixture, but also the wins on uh, on defence, uh, the wins on attack when they're driving lineouts going well, the scrums, uh, milking penalties. Those, you, you've got to cling on to those little positives. And it's, it's, a, it's a very slow 
well, can be quite a slow progress, particularly in attack. I mean, strange enough, defence, I think, is slightly easier to get right. And uh, Felix Jones looks like he's hit the ground running, really, and the team have bought into that. But really, defence is, 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 I think, is, is a more simple part of the game. The attack, where you've got so many moving parts, you've got so many things relying on uh, you know, four or five pairs of hands, uh, the weather, uh, the, the opposition, all this sort of stuff. Sometimes you, the, the attack can take a lot longer to get into or click into some sort of shape. But as I said earlier on, I think it's positive the way England are looking to play. They haven't picked uh, Fraser Dingwall and to told him to play like Ollie Lawrence or Manu Tulangi. They told him to say, told him to play like you do at your club. Um, I agree with Nick that, that if you look at that first choice, well, you look at the, the, the starting back line that, that, that was on the weekend, you, you've got fairly lightweight players and oh, no disrespect to them they're great athletes and they've got very very good skills but they haven't got a big ball carrying center mm. or even a big ball carrying wing like a joe cockle singer uh, and that can be crucial that will be crucial against better teams better defensive teams better better teams where you have to score points so whether they whether they need to bring someone into the pack to do a bit more of that um I get, you know, loads of time for ben Earl, but not necessarily a massive ball carrying number eight um, you know, Roots has done well. I, I think they just need that. I think that, that's another dimension they do need. It's somewhere on the field. They need to get someone who can get them over the game line. And it's only two or three yards. And then suddenly you've got Ford and you've got Dingwall. You've got Henry Slade on the front foot. You've got uh, Freddie Stewart chiming in on the front foot. Uh, and you've got the wingers. You've got two or three, two of the three or four wingers they've got. If you can get that sort of two or three yards on the front foot, that makes a massive difference to the game. But... Mm. Yeah, I think from from both of point of view, you just got to play on the positives. You have got to say, look, we're winning. Uh, the, the the ceiling is very high at the moment. We don't we're nowhere near. We're we're probably playing at about fifty percent of our abilities if you look at the individuals, uh, and that's what you've got to do. And then hopefully that sort of enthusiasm, that confidence gets uh, contagious throughout the squad, and suddenly you start playing well. And the other thing with that, Nick, as well. I mean, at, at times they they went back to what they they know that with you know, the, the route a lot higher, and and it worked in the end with. Uh, the mistake made by Wales, but um, how how do you balance? I mean, take taking you know when you've got uh, new players, younger players, and some experience, and and always a crowd that wants more. Uh, do you, do you think that uh, Twickenham is from the stands understanding that this season is just the beginning of the new cycle? Well, it's uh, well, you get a. As I, say, I was going to say a lot of different demographics at Twickenham, but probably one overall. But it's been a, it's been a frustrated um, fan base for, for two years. You know, there was a bit of hope held out last season when Steve Borthwick came in for the Six Nations. But then, you know, we got panned by 50. Um, I think the first time we ever conceded 50 at home um, by France. So that sort of subdued it a little bit. And yesterday I was at a game. I don't know if shoots at a game. You did get the feeling that, you know, with the selection, with the attempt, um, with ball in hand against Italy last week, mm. that they were, were going to get behind. But it just was one of those games. And I don't think it's helped. And I'm sort of sidetracking here by somebody officiating, to be honest with you, with the endless time it takes for a TMO decision. Um, you know, the scrum resets and things like that. You know, that's, that's probably a, a bigger issue in rugby union at the moment. We're not talking about that. But, you know, England, England do... When England get on the front foot, and look, you can play to your strengths with the ball in the air, and Freddie Stewart was magnificent yesterday, and why wouldn't you, if you've selected him, play to his strengths? Damn what everyone else thinks. Mm -hmm. But once, say, if he, if he takes a ball and gets you on the front foot and you've got the defence retreating, it's our ability then to keep them retreating or to create those openings within the next three or four phases. And I think that's what we've really got to work on the next two weeks if we're ready to progress. Um, Nick, just one more before I come back to you, George, then on, on this, because we're finding in a lot of our sports now where we're using the technical ability to, to make decision-making. We'll come on and talk about Scotland and France uh, uh, with that in mind. But with, with, with everybody, it, it's, a, it's a fine balance here between everything, isn't it? Because of the, um, the talk about uh, everything to do with concussion that we've had in here and, and all the other bits and pieces and making sure that the combination of the uh, referee and the assistants and the, the, the technical aspect to get the right result. It does mean that we lose that flow, though, doesn't it, Nick? Yes, 100%, and something needs to be done about it. Uh, as you said, 
We'll, we'll talk about the Scotland incident, so I won't cover that. But yeah. look, player safety over entertainment always. Okay, that, that has to be the priority. Yeah. Um, but there has to be an understanding of what you're watching and why you're watching it. And the gladiator, gladiatorial arena that is rugby and... You know, myself and George have been through it, and you know the sacrifices these guys are making. They are unique athletes, unique people. It's not a game for everyone. So, you know, when you're talking about the community game and head clashes mm -hmm. and lowering the tackle height, that, that's a different story. But to get people interested in the game, whether they do want to play it or they want to come and watch it or, or whatever mm -hmm. and support it, um, you have to have more flow to this game. And... I think it's getting a bit silly now. The referee, a lot's been taken out of the referee's hands, a little bit like cricket with the DRS. And mm. you think you've got an LBW decision, but and same with the VAR, VAR and that immediate emotional and passionate high that you get can, can be completely reduced. And, you know, that's what sport's about, isn't it? And look, we're, we're talking on here, be talking during the week. As much as you've added technology to the game, you do want to get the big calls right. Of course you do. Yeah. Um, as much as you want to add technology to the game, you're taking away what the what the game, the essence of the game really is. And people will talk about controversies in sport for years to come, like they've done in years gone gone by. And that's what drives the conversation before or after a game. And I think as well, though, George, don't you, with that in mind, you know, we, there is still an acceptance. It might be not straight after a game or anything like that from both players and fans that, you know. If it is more about the two 15s up against each other with a referee that feels that even if he's made a slight mistake or whatever, he's not going to be completely punished for that because th that sort of thing does happen, and yet still keeping um, a, a good eye on uh, some of the big hits and whether everything is right. We can't go completely the other way, though, where you're dissecting as... Nick was saying every single moment that could possibly cause a problem for somebody in 25 years. Yeah, I mean, it's such a such a sticky excuse. Yeah. The sports now is a sticky wicket. Yeah, there's so much, you want to get things right. You've got technology, uh, and the technology has bought, been bought in to make the game safe and, and to make sure that the, the big decisions uh, are, are correct. Um, I think uh, what exactly what Nick says. You, you've, got, you've got to you've got to keep the game interesting. I think if you watch America, I, I love American football. I watch a lot of American football. They use technology there, but the game itself is very stop start. They have six, eight, ten seconds of action, then you know the, the forty seconds downtime. So they can do that. They can afford to send the, the the footage to New York and come back and listen to it on the radio and talk to the talk to the head office and see what they make a decision. I'd like to see something a bit more like the NRL and, and the Super League. I think rugby league for whatever reason seems to have man managed to develop the technology uh, far better than we have. I don't know what's what's holding us back. I, I know rugby union is a slightly more technical game. There's a bit more going on with the rucks and scrums. But you watch rugby league and the game flows and the referee's mm. talking to his mate in the bunker. He doesn't stop and go and watch the screen unless there's something specific to look at. Anything, they, they have a report, so that goes on report after a game and it's dealt with in the week, if it's sort of foul play or, or something like that. They have they have head injury assessments as well, so there's no reason we're not giving that up. We can, mm. all the players have gum shields now, so if you need to pull someone off, you can pull someone off uh, as the game's going. I think, I think we just need to be a little bit less rigid. I think we're far too automatic you know the referees have a, a very set sort of script they stick to when they talk to the vr if you listen to the aussie rugby league it's like they're down the pub hey mate what did you see there yep yeah, yeah saw that yeah yeah okay i put that on report they all cross arms or yeah. they allow a try or disallow a try whatever it is so i think we, we've got this technology now and it's still relatively in its infancy i suppose i just think we need to be a bit more relaxed about it and have in the back of our minds let's keep the game flowing whilst trying to yeah. get the things yeah, look, you make a great point there, George. And, and I think, Nick, as well, for me, one of the other things is trust the officials and, and let those officials understand that they are going to get their backing. I mean, it is difficult at times. I mean, you know, we, we could, we'll talk about the French against the Scottish and a, and a try that nobody could decide whether the ball was grounded or not that would have changed the, the result. Um, but, you know, let the officials do their job. Everybody who plays rugby now at whatever age, understands uh, the problems that there are with it. There's progressive rugby. There's everything to help everybody coming into the new game and what have you. Uh, it, it's all there now. 
So we, at times we have to let this game flow for the excitement of both playing it and watching it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, people want to get home on time as well, don't they? Because <laughs> um, some of these games, some of these games with uh, yeah. the team and owner of you and everything, they go on about 20, 30 minutes longer than they should. Um, and, you, and you say that, let the referee decide. And I, I just go back to what I said earlier and what George is saying is, you know, the more technology you use, the less the referee is deciding it. And I think you're absolutely right. You know, there, there's going to be human error. That is part of the romance of sport. Yes, it's frustrating. Mm. But I think if you look through the ages in every single sport and you look through the last 20 years or however long it's been, you know, since you've had Hawkeye in, in tennis and, and, and cricket and you now have VAR in football. Obviously, we've had the sort of TMO since, I think, 2007, mm. deciding tries now a lot more foul play, <clears throat> knock-ons three within three phases. Is the top sides still seem to win the competitions? Yeah. And the worst sides still seem to be knocked out and relegated. So, yes, we want to get the big calls. And there is more on the line. There is more on the line in mm. terms of jobs, um, in terms of what it means to people, in terms of finances, you know, possible sponsorships, we understand that. But it's not, they've not got it so wrong in the past, right? Yeah. And the past, if you went away, certainly on a rugby tour or a cricket tour, you got a, you got a, you got a home a ref, you know, in, down in South Africa, then you were getting no favours, you, mm. you know what I mean? But mm. generally when it came to the test matches, the better side would win. Yeah. And and it's always been the case. So, it, as I say, it's not a case of, oh, my God, you know, about 20 25% of the time, so-and-so won the league or so-and-so won the cup or whatever it might have been, the European Cup or the World Cup. They didn't deserve to win because the refereeing was so bad. It was never that case. Hmm. So, but what you're taking away from the game, I think, is far greater than some of the decisions that are being questioned. Yeah, yeah, good points that you make. A quick word uh, from both of you about Scotland and France. There was this try that the referee had said no try, uh, it was inconclusive. Scotland decided, of course, that, that they thought it was a try, uh, which would have gone on to uh, sort things out for them. Uh, France, of course, got away with it. But, George, these things do happen now and again. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'm not too sure the, what, what, what the regulations are now, but it was always the case that the benefit of doubt went to the defending team in yeah. rugby union. I know rugby league was the other way around. If there was any doubt, then the attacking team got the uh, try, for example, try a given. So for this, from this situation, it was fairly clear to me. It was non-conclusive. The referee uh, had already said no try, and then there was no conclusive evidence to suggest otherwise. I know it looks like it scored a try, and if you're, you know, uh, if you if you're carrying the ball there, you probably know if you did or not. But the fact the fact is, to me, it was inconclusive. So that's no try. Uh, and actually, Finn Russell. Uh, said so in his after the after match. I thought he was quite quite uh, quite good actually. The way he just sort of said, you know, we've got to play better. There are plenty of other opportunities to win the game. It was a pretty turgid game, even uh, even by yesterday's standards. It was probably the worst of the, the games yesterday. But um, yeah, the Scots had enough chance to win the game and um, and didn't. Uh, and yeah, as, as Nick says, generally. You know, very, very rarely do uh, the best teams lose games on on those sort of 50-50 decisions. It's you know, the, the the better teams are the better teams for a reason. They're able to get over that. So yeah, for me, I, I don't, I don't. Yeah, you know, I see there's a bit of controversy. Of course, there's always going to be. But mm. for me, it's for me, it was no try. It's just that that's, that's the that's the way the game is played, as as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, the the final whistle, I'm afraid, uh, on you, Nick and George, has uh, just uh, been blown. But terrific as always, and thank you very much indeed for your expertise here on the. Sunday Night Club when we're talking about Six Nations Rugby. Uh, we've got cricket to come, a third test preview with Neil Burns and Angus Fraser to round off a programme that I know you've enjoyed and we've enjoyed because you have. Good morning, it's just gone six o'clock. I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, 
a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. <laughs> King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and banged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry going to sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on <laughs> what just happened. <laughs> Whoa, listen! <laughs> It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity, because I think you've Why? got to look at someone... What are you well, going okay. up for? This is the Plank of the Week, Michael. Will. <laughs> bloody therapy session. <laughs> the problem is, Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> Prime Minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had, and so yeah. they would have been better off calling it Unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple, the downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names, the New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. As long as, it's a, as, long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And yeah. that's because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. How are you going to stop the votes? This is an international problem. How's that going for your party? I'm a millennial. You're a Victorian, I think. <laughs> this helps weather people. I'm going to help the vet's office. <laughs> I'm Jeremy Kyle. And I'm Nicola Thorpe. Welcome to Talk Today. Well, a very good evening to you. And uh, we're going to talk cricket now for the rest of the show before Howard Hughes and the Unexplained. Uh, delighted to say that Neil Burns and Angus Fraser are with us. It's uh, a third test that starts on Thursday in Rajkot and... Uh, what a match this will be, there's no doubt about that with what we've had so far. Uh, just sort of one or two bits to tidy up, first of all. I feel so desperately um, sad for Jack Leach. I mean, after all the problems that he had uh, with that stress fracture, and now, of course, he's injured himself in the first test, took no part in the second test, but has, has made his way home, and, and Neil won't be part of uh, this series going forward. Very sad news for Jack Leach. Um, but I think he's a very resilient character. He's had a lot of challenges with his health and with injury throughout his career. Plus, he also had that period where his bowling action was questioned and he had to remodel it. So thoughts very much with him. Um, but from England's point of view, they would be delighted that Tom Hartley has performed so well in the first test, um, first two matches of this test series. Um, and the fact that Shah Bashir came into the second test match and had a, you know, a very decent... Test match debut. It's amazing, isn't it? As you, you've mentioned, those two, and if I add Ahmed to that, uh, Rian Ahmed, and Joe R Root now as the sort of fourth uh, option if necessary. Did we ever think we would be so quickly in this sort of situation, Angus? 
Uh, well, no, I, 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 I suppose, that, I mean, you have huge sympathy for, for, for Leach. Uh, yeah. As Neil sort of said, he's had lots of issues, uh, not just physical, but sort of um, illnesses as well. And um, it, it, it's tough, isn't it? I mean, he must, he must sort of be sort of wondering what he needs to do. But so my, my one dilemma is Hartley's the only left-arm spinner. Yes, you've got a leg spinner. Would it have been worth calling someone up? Seems that Dawson has done something uh, to upset uh, Ben Stokes or or Brendan McCullum because um, they seem to sort of, if they can avoid selecting him, they seem to be doing it. Um, any thoughts on that one, Neil? Well, I think the integrity of our domestic system um, is being questioned here because if performers like Liam Dawson have such an outstanding season and they're not involved in the initial group, that's a surprise. Um, but when you're picking people who have got virtually no track record, purely on the basis that it's a hunch or you like the height they deliver the ball from, then one has to question, you know, why is so much money, i.e. almost £40 million being spent on a domestic system to underpin an international team? So I think we're at a really interesting phase of world cricket, uh, not just because of the franchise leagues, but one really has to question you know, what it's there for if it isn't producing players of the right calibre. Mm. And secondly, please. if they do get selected, um, if they do perform like Liam Dawson and they don't get selected, then something seriously is wrong. The two of you, come I on. Think I think it was interesting. I was chatting with someone the other yeah. day about, about this and they were saying, well, and it wasn't to defend the selections, but it was almost to reason. I try and sort of reason with the decision, and it was well, what conditions in England will a spinner bowl in that are anything like what they're going to experience in India? So therefore, making a selection on someone who's performed well in England, give an idea that they may well handle certain situations a little bit better. But uh, I suppose that the selectors and this England set up are sort of back in their own judgments and, and obviously the way that things have gone they've they've got more things right than they got wrong in flying in the face of what we thought I think was normal before so uh, it is it is a sort of throwing out a sort of real question to county cricket isn't it about mm. sort of uh, are you providing the right conditions to, to, to prepare people for the test that they're going to get abroad but equally I mean we're going to start the season in a couple of months time and uh, I don't think there's going to be similar to Raj put this weekend. Yeah, no, I don't think we just lost you a little bit there, uh, Angus, on a couple of words, but we we, we got the, the the gist of all of that, so uh, everything fine. Neil, one thing to uh, just before I want to come back and uh, talk about Ben Folks in a short while. We mentioned him last week, but just for somebody else who won't, Virat Kohli, who's, who's played no part in this series. Uh, because of personal reasons, has, has confirmed that he's going to miss the rest of this series as well. And uh, obviously an important decision that um, their selectors uh, and the Board of Control for Cricket in India decided, you know, this, this was the right thing and, and totally respects and supports him. Yes, it's sad news for Virat and one doesn't know the circumstances behind his reasons to make himself unavailable for selection but one just hopes that he and his family and um, any particular difficulties that they're encountering can be overcome but i think the lovely thing that's happening in world sport now is that team management and administration and, and ownership uh, models are much more understanding and much more accommodating uh, whereas maybe in the past um, people felt that they had to continue playing for fear of being excluded. Mm. So we're living in a in a much better era, where the care of the human being is prioritised, and we've seen a similar situation with England, with Harry Brook. And one just hopes that whatever challenges Harry Brook is um, having to deal with, that are being overcome successfully. Yeah, look, great point, um, Neil. I'm going to start with you and uh, uh, bring in Angus about this. Um, I, as uh, a man on who's uh, a veteran, as they call it now, Indian writer on cricket and everything, has been uh, writing about Ben Folkes and saying that he is the best keeper he has seen uh, on pitches in India 
uh, since Alan Knott. Well, that's high praise indeed. And clearly Ben Folks has kept wicket superbly in these first two test matches. Um, but I think the challenge of keeping wicket on turning pitches, particularly when there's variable bounce, is something that you only realise how difficult it is when someone struggles. And what's been lovely um, for the Wicket Keepers Union is that St uh, Folks has taken two catches from under edges that have confirmed his quality in that staying low um, and being able to take balls that, that don't bounce is a, is a real skill. I think what's also been really challenging for him has been that some of these pitches have really bounced as well. Um, there was one catch that um, went down as a missed chance that went high off the shoulder of the bat and caught him on the right thumb. Um, but even the very best wicket keepers are going to, to miss chances. Mm. But I think the praise for Ben Folks, we've got to be careful that it's not over the top um, because Alex Stewart was very quick early in Ben Folks' career when he signed him from Essex to say he was the best wicket keeper in the world. <laughs> Great promotion by the Surrey cricket manager, but I always felt that Angus Fraser had John Simpson at Middlesex, yeah. who I thought was the best wicket keeper in England at the time. Um, and we're lucky to have you know these excellent wicket keepers in English cricket because they they set the standard and you know the era that I played in and that Angus played in we had Jack Russell who was yeah you know, a wonderful wicket keeper for England and then Angus would have played a, a number of Test matches for England with him. And Ang Angus, one other thing I think that uh, Alex Stewart, obviously who's been uh, uh, involved in the preparations uh, with uh, folks for this series, it has said how he has basically. Um, concentrated and worked incredibly hard on the standing up to the stumps and uh, how vital that has been and 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 really gained his, his confidence and, and everything else with an awful lot of heart of course he's got the control of course he's got his movement of course he's got his balance and of course he's a great keeper but he's had to work again at that um, because he wasn't even in the side, you know, mentally there, you've got to be right as well. He doesn't want to snatch and get that first chance. And if he drops one, he wants to be able to put that straight out of the mind and not be under the same pressure. And I think it's showed, I mean, he has been superb. Uh, no, he is superb. And, and again, I, I, I agree with Neil, sort of John Simpson at Middlesex and now moved to Sussex. Uh, he's been outstanding too. And it's, I suppose, a testament to, to cricket in this country that the fact that we, uh, the wicket keeping position is still a very important, glamorous, and highly rated. It's not something where, uh, obviously, we have been through spells with Duncan Fletcher in charge, where Geraint Jones was sort of in charge, and people questioning whether he was the best keeper, but he was capable of scoring runs. Uh, we had Matthew Pryor, who was an outstanding keeper. So we've had a history of wonderful keepers in in this country, and, and folks fits into that uh, superbly. And, yeah, it doesn't happen by chance. And, I mean, I obviously... Middlesex got John Simpson working with Jack Russell, which was one of the good decisions, well, one of the better decisions probably I made. <laughs> um, but it's, and, and Jack Russell used to work with Alan Knott, so you, yeah. you're going back quite a long time in, in the sort of annals of wicket keepers in this country, but just watching them train, and at times it's like, what on earth is going on in that corner of an indoor school there? It's <laughs> like a, it's like sort of nothing you've ever seen with bath mats and bits of wood, and it's you just leave them to it, but uh, it obviously works because um, and they and they and they put a great deal of pride in it. They work extremely hard at it, and it's often the keep at cricket grounds. They're the last to leave. Mm -hmm. Every other player sort of gets the batting, gets the bowling, and they do their fielding as a group. Um, sort of there, everybody's left and sort of going back to the hotel, and the keepers are still there out in the middle uh, practicing because it is an unbelievably difficult skill. I don't know how they. Yeah. Stand up there with the bat, the ball, and everything flying in front of you. You've got to be incredibly brave as well as skillful. Yeah, and uh, Neil, I mean, both of us, you at the the full uh, county level. I only ever made it to minor county level, but kept to some great uh, players like Derek Parry from the the West Indies and Stuart Turner at times and others. And uh, it's it, I always thought of uh, keepers as as like goalkeepers as well. Another strange, we were detached from the rest of them because we knew uh, just how much work, and, and you will have certainly done, and to show what you did, uh, how important it was to do that work, to get that that little bit extra that you possibly can. Well, success only comes through hard work. 
and it's it's a given but i think where wicket keeping is different is you're playing in a team where you can only keep to the bowlers that you've got but you still need to actually develop your game against different types of bowling so you have to artificially create those opportunities so if your team hasn't got a left arm spinner you've got to set up practices um to still be able to keep well against left arm spin mm. same with if you're keeping wicket to a team that's got mainly seam bowlers and maybe an off spinner you've still got to set up practices for a super fast bowler to be able to deal with that extra pace and, and that extra bounce i was very privileged in my career to keep wicket to a lot of leg spin mm. initially through Essex School's cricket with a young Nasser Hussain, who was a brilliant schoolboy leg spinner. And then um, when I joined Somerset, I, I had the privilege of keeping wicket to Mushtaq Ahmed. And then at the end of my career at Leicestershire, I had one magnificently enjoyable season keeping wicket to Anil Kumble because Anil Kumble's cricket was exceptional because he had the attitude of a fast bowler, lots of aggression. He bowled very straight, so there weren't that many balls that you would take. But he got exceptional bounce. So when he when he did beat the bat on the outside, it was quite often hitting the shoulder of the bat or the batsman's thumb. And that was a very specialist um, yeah. experience to go through and lots of practice had to be done and I absolutely loved it. Yeah, great insight from Neil and from Angus. Look, we're going to talk about this third test in the last part of the Sunday Night Club with the guys here on Talk TV. Today on Talk TV. Hey, very good morning to you. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. And we're on your smart speaker. If it was Osama bin Laden, a terrorist as well, a war criminal as well, would you be giving him a floor? Would you be asking for him to be interviewed and giving a space so he could explain himself? A woman can become a man, and a man can become a woman. And if you think that, you're certifiably insane. There is something to be said, though, about types of breed, that if they do no. turn, then no. you can be no. in trouble. I've got a cockapoo. No. If that cockapoo turns on me, I win the battle. I don't see any sign of forgiveness from the other members of the family for the terrible lies and disloyalty which he's shown. This concept that actually kids wouldn't carry knives if they could go and play tiddlywinks at the, you know, the corner of the street or whatever. I think it's a nonsense. King Charles has been diagnosed with cancer. The palace released a new picture of King Charles showing His Royal Highness smiling and buoyant despite the shock news. Move over, Harry. When it comes to celebrity pals, William has just landed one of the biggest stars on the planet. Prince William has only gone and bagged Tom Cruise as a surprise celebrity guest for the London Air Ambulance charity gala he spoke at. It's not like, you know, they live in an average semi and where's Harry gonna sleep? You might have thought he's come all the way. Couldn't he at least have spent a couple of days with them at Sandringham just, you know, to use the vernacular, chilling out a bit? What are you doing? I'm just about to do it. Ooh! Ooh! It's carry on what just <laughs> happened. Ooh, whoa, listen. It may be that it's a more serious problem at the BBC than just her. I'm problem. giving her some objectivity because I think you've got to look at someone. Why are you well, going okay. up for? This is the plank of the week, Michael. Will. <laughs> Not the therapy session. <laughs> the problem is Liz Truss is the most unpopular <laughs> prime minister <laughs> exactly. that we've ever had. And so yeah. they would have been better off calling it unpopcon. Really. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nobody is, is spending any money. They're not prepared to do it. I mean, why is that? Uh, quite simple. The downturn in the spend is three simple words, financial fair play. Stop creating all of these funny little factions with their funny little names. The New Conservatives, the ERG, the Common Sense Research Group, the Red Wall, Red Trouser, Popcorn. I mean, Popcorn, what, what is that? And with the gun culture, mm -hmm. in 30 states, 30 of the US states, there is no minimum age for guns. 
as long as it's, a, as long as it's a long gun. So, yeah, so a rifle or a shotgun, you can be of any age. 44% of kids haven't seen a dentist in the last year. And that's yeah. because 80% of dentists aren't taking on children. Yeah. yeah. Now, that can't be right, can yeah. it? Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out of the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument. We tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Well, a very good evening to you. We're talking cricket at the moment. Delighted to say that Neil Burns and uh, Angus Fraser are giving us a real insight, of course, at the very high uh, level uh, of uh, test cricket at the moment. Raj Cott uh, hasn't had so many tests as uh, some of the other areas. It's uh, well known for its uh, good wickets. And uh, Neil Burns, the last time that uh, England uh, played at Raj Cott, uh, both Stokes and uh, Joe Root got big hundreds. And... Uh, by all accounts, with some of the domestic cricket that's been going on there, it's going to be um, uh, it's going to be quite hard and, and, and tactically to think how you're going to get um, batsmen out on such a good pitch. Well, the key thing for England is they've got to make a big first inning score, in spite of the fact that they had a just wonderful win that first Test match. The reality is there was a nearly 200 run deficit on the in the first innings, and then. In this second test match, which India won, we gave away 143 runs on first innings. So first innings runs are going to be absolutely crucial. The good news is that Zach Crawley's in top form, having got two excellent 70s in the in the uh, second test match at Visak. But this Rajkot test match is going to require Joe Root to rediscover his best form. It's going to require Johnny Bairstow to play somewhere near the top of his game. And it's going to require... Ben Duckett to produce something more than a really attractive half century. He's got to go on and make a big century, and Zach Crawley's got to convert his 70s into big centuries if we're going to create a commanding position. From that point of view, uh, Angus, uh, in uh, situations like this, I mean, you as a bowler, obviously, but uh, you know, you want the bats, you you want them to win the toss, hopefully, and I, I guess bat first and and get an extraordinary uh, score or big total on 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 there what what are the the pitfalls for that though as a batsman with the way that England are playing at the moment on a on a good one or do they just continue the bas ball yeah well, I wouldn't say that well, I suppose the one exception to that to be honest has been Joe Root and I mean his last sort of innings was I'm not quite sure what he was was trying to do and uh, Consequence of him, his thumb or his or, or the injury that he had or the thing that kept him off the field, I don't know. But uh, uh, Ducky plays as he plays, and I mean Stokes has sort of leaps from one extreme to the other, doesn't it? And, and Pope um, just batted properly. I mean Alex Stewart has gone over very well, and I think one of his sort of I say frustrations, but the thing with bad boys that to get the best out of players, you want them to play the natural game, and Pope did that when he got that brilliant 190 and. I think we need Joe Root to do that. So uh, sometimes when you feel that you've got a, I mean, the, the, the nature of this England setup, it doesn't work out. They almost double down, don't they? They go there and, and therefore it can work out, but it can go bust as well. And but the, I think they're just going to, well, the, they're playing against a good side. It's, it, it's not off, It's not always their fault. I mean, yes, no. You, 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 you're you batting a certain way and you can't just sort of suddenly change because you get going and then you stop and you start and whatever. It's it's very much a sort of a feel and momentum type sort of situation. And I suppose they've just got to concentrate and make better decisions for longer, really. And uh, that's the way that you stay in. But to suddenly sort of having played as they've played for a period of time to change that um, is it, difficult. But I, I think someone like Bairstow needs to do something. I mean, he's... Uh, not some time now. You've got Lawrence obviously in the wings. Brooks is not going to be there. Um, and 
I suppose the one you were talking before about the wicketkeeper, heaven forbid that all of a sudden an effort to, to sort of short the batting, they give Bairstow the gloves and leave folks out. No. I don't think that's going to happen. No. Uh, but it's certainly a route yeah. that's been gone down on numerous occasions in the past. No, it certainly has. Um, and Neil, the, the, the other thing, of course, is that, uh, you, you know, when it all works and uh, the, the, the freedom that they use and, and have the confidence to do that, of course, is fantastic. But there will be possibly times... Uh, certainly in the first innings, for you, as you were saying, for them to, to make sure that they get a big score, that they can't just um, just have a go and hit their way out of trouble the whole time. And I think that India showed in the second test as well that, that, that they'll feel that they, they, that they can tease this England side out as well now. Well, the key performer is Jasprit Bumrah. He's become the fastest Indian to 150 wickets in Test match cricket. He's done it in only 34 Test matches. And this week he was the first ever Indian to be named as the number one bowler in the world as a seam bowler. Previously, Kapil Dev had been a number two. Um, I think it was about 1980 that happened. Mm. But he is just a brilliant bowler. And I think the series is going to be decided here in Rajkot, if it is a flat wicket, mm by how well Boomer bowls, because on flat pitches, um, the very best bowlers not only don't go for too many runs, but they're capable of producing a delivery or a spell that blows people away, and that's what happened in the last Test match. So England, I think, have got to be very careful. Um, they need big first innings runs, and they've been too reliant in their previous wins on having a magic performance from Ben Stokes, or sometimes Johnny Besto was the person who, who produced the magic but more people need to contribute. Yeah, no, I think it's going to be interesting. I mean, again, looking at the makeup. Sorry, no, no, carry on. It's almost sort of they've rotated the seams, haven't they? Mark would play the first test. James Anderson played this test. Uh, mm -hmm. India played two seams. All right, they've not got much out of one of their seams on each occasion, and Boomer has been the star. Uh, but will England? Do you just pick bowlers because the conditions say that, or do you pick the bowlers that you think are going to get the most wickets? So. Uh, Wood and Anderson, then if it is a flat pitch, there might be a reason to play two seamers there uh, and to play a spinner uh, less than they've, they've done in the previous test. But uh, there's some decisions to make. And again, <laughs> they'll, be, they'll be being made on the golf courses in Saudi Arabia, isn't it? Or wherever they are for the last last few days. Well, personally, I would play Ollie Robinson. OK. And, you know, we with, talk about... With Anderson? Yeah, so these spin bowlers and the height they're bowling the ball from is being one of the factors behind their selection. But Robinson's a very tall bowler and he's not that dissimilar from Angus in that when he bowls well, he gets a lot of wickets. But when he's not taking wickets, he's not going for runs. And one of the concerns I have about our spin bowlers is I'm not sure that they are accurate enough against good players, A, to... Um, bowl good players out, but also make sure that the, the target is in the first innings is less than 350. Mm. Um, so I would seriously consider going with Anderson and Robinson and leaving out um, Bashir or possibly uh, Rian Ahmed. But Rian Ahmed, I can see them wanting to pick him because he strengthens the lower order batting. But personally, I would pick my best bowlers and Rian Ahmed doesn't feature in that for me. Fantastic. Uh, that's a great way to finish, guys. Neil... And Angus, thank you as always so very much indeed for your expertise on the Sunday Night Club. Really enjoyed the show. Don't forget our new podcast. It'll be out tomorrow, back of the stand. And on Wednesday, if you missed our middle hour, we've got bits and pieces of all of that with finance and football as for our second podcast this week on all of your platforms uh, when it comes to podcasts, of course. Uh, as far as uh, television is concerned, Peter Cardwell is next. As far as radio, it's Howard Hughes. Enough of that television stuff. Be here on radio because we've got a big show for you on The Unexplained from 10 o'clock, Mark. I'm so pleased you asked. I hope everything is OK with you, by the way. You know I worry. Yeah, but everything is, is really OK with me. <laughs> I actually saw what I thought. I mean, because I saw something in the sky. The skies have been brilliant when it hasn't been raining at night, haven't they? Mm. Recently. Them, though they have. They and I, have. I actually saw a shooting, what I thought was a shooting star, and I think it was. It's certainly something. And I look for these things now, um, thanks well, to your great show. 
A lot of people do, and they, they do send me their pictures. And, of course, I can't do image analysis, but I do know people who can. Mm. A, a lot of people, a lot of times these things are misidentifications of lines of Starlink satellites being launched, or maybe yeah. even on occasions people seeing the International Space Station. But, you know, let's be frank and honest about it. We cannot rule out all of them on that basis because some of them, and, in fact, there's one of those, if I get time to do the story tonight, one in Lancashire, that was difficult to explain and they had to go through all the possibilities in the end they came up with the idea that it was a meteor but i think some people were still not convinced and some of these things remain you know, unexplained. That's why we're doing the show. On the show tonight then, Mark, yeah. uh, Steve Bassett, UAPs, where are we at with this? You know, before we all lose the will to live, where are we at? Is it coming down the tracks or not? Uh, we'll have to make other plans if it isn't, but, you know, I think something might be. Uh, we'll have a, an analyst, a space and aviation analyst, Carter Palmer, on tonight, talking about war in space, among other things. Uh, we'll get an update from Saxavord, which is Scotland's spaceport, and the very enthusiastic man who runs it. Professor Ivy Loeb will be here on the latest on those spherules discovered on the uh, bottom of the ocean off Papua New Guinea. Uh, Rick Minter will be talking big cats. Mark L. Cowden will be talking about a super haunted place in Fermanagh, Northern Ireland. In hour two, paranormal investigator William Tabone in Australia will be on and... We're saving the very best for the very last. Uh, James Burke, man who pioneered science broadcasting on TV. He did a lot of the space broadcasting, of course, 60s and 70s, uh, then became an international megastar with his own series like Connections. He is 87 years of age. I spoke with him this morning. You will hear that conversation. We'll talk about AI and the way forward for mankind, if you can take it after 11 o'clock. Well, there is you, a lot in it. Oh, i tell you what, Howard, I'm, I'm fascinated to listen to James Burke. What one of one of the go-to men as far as I'm concerned watching as a not even a teenager a, a youngster with the polo and everything else they used to have so many it, it did so many important programs didn't they James they didn't have the technical facilities that we do today they didn't have the bells and whistles and the easy ability to connect with any point on the globe in the snap of a finger what they had though uh, was ability the ability to ana analyze things in your head and think on your feet and they were just i think a great generation of broadcasters and scientists uh, yeah. on those shows not just not to diss the people who are around at the moment but those people with what they had and what they knew did an amazing job so we'll talk about a little of that too tonight just one final thing on all of that i went to uh, a lecture back at my school my old school uh, on ai uh, uh the 10 days or so ago and what was fascinating that the, the speaker was um a, a visiting professor who ai and the machines as they call them and building he did 25 minutes on ai but he said i'm not actually going to talk about ai i am mm.